Riverside Resources is a mineral exploration company focused on making big discoveries and is advancing a strong portfolio of gold, silver, and copper properties in the Americas. Riverside owns commanding land packages near active mines and deposits where new discoveries have been efficiently developed. Riverside Resources is exploring Mexico, a country with a rich mining history and an even more promising future, boasting silver and gold production increases of 5 to 10 percent per year. Riverside is also exploring British Columbia, a stable jurisdiction with abundant mineral wealth. Riverside Resources is driven, dynamic, and with its proven approach, turns knowledge into value by leveraging its proprietary mineral databases to generate and acquire high potential projects. Riverside mitigates risk by advancing many of these projects through joint ventures and alliances, generating cash and share payments, partner-funded drilling, and preserving a tight share structure. And Riverside's business model increases the opportunity for its shareholders to take part in a major discovery with the advancement of multiple projects. Increasing value and opportunity for every shareholder dollar. Riverside Resources. Knowledge is golden. Two, one. Let's go! Come on, Comb! I thought you were going to get in on that. Uh, man, I'm your host, Troy Tittlemeyer, the PBE podcast. Join in person, live. We don't handshake, but a fist, fist bump. bump. Fist bump for the time. I don't eat off my knuckles. No, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's okay to fist bump in a room. Uh, man, this show was absolutely amazing and, and excitement at the right time for me as a geoscientist to hear the progression of our understanding of these deep features of the planet. And it's, mm. it's how it's put itself together. And, and going into a deep dive into the gravity and magnetic space and really, really understand all the areas in which it affects, right? From the minerals to the oil and gas to de-risking assets. It's just to geohazard identification it's it, it's amazing the yeah. presentation that was put together by Colm was yep. fantastic it was spot on yeah. and so i'm going to read Colm's bio so Colm murphy is responsible for the technical promotion and assessment of ftg full tensor gravity gradiometry it's important for the show yeah. applications company-wide at bell geospace his leadership ensures the high quality design and implementations uh, implementation of geoscience solutions along with the mentoring and development of geoscience staff. He holds a PhD in geophysics from NUI, Galway, Ireland, and over 25 years of industry experience working FTG, gravity and magnetics, data solutions for oil and gas and mineral exploration projects worldwide. Calm, sir, it's an honor to share this microphone in this time with you. Thank you. <laughs> It was a my, great my pleasure to be here. <laughs> thank yeah, thank you, thank you. And skips, I mean, we so what, what we like to do in the intro is to to go back and think, you know, what did we really take away from this show? Mm -hmm. What was the significance of this stuff? What did we like? What did we learn? Yeah, skips, you want to start or calm? You want to go? I, I'll, I'll start. I'll okay, start. okay, yeah, because yeah, because yeah. it, because it's fresh in my brain right now. It's, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was it. that full tensor gravity gradiometry that we were looking at that survey shot by De Beers, right? Yeah. And I the detail that you could see compared to just your standard gravity data was unreal. It was unreal. <laughs> I mean, what you're seeing as far as structures and then like we were kind of going into when you have that hard data, like boots on the ground data, then you can really start making some advanced interpretations. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I mean that photo itself, I mean, it's just worth oh, looking man. at it, man. It's beautiful. And, and explaining how all those different, uh, the different colors in that color bar and how each one of those things affect where it was curvature, intensity, what, whatever have you. It was just, I mean, you could stare at that thing all day and barely scratch the surface. Like that's as, as far as a geoscientist. And then tomorrow you're like, uh, did that change the color bar? Something well, yeah, this looks like totally different. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Spot on, man. That, that was amazing to get to at the end of that presentation, man. That was so much fun. And cause you're a structural geologist. So you're looking at that thing with act with eyes that can actually see and make sense of why those features would be trending in the directions they are. Mm -hmm. And so you leveraging that experience in that conversation was just, I mean, it, it lights out. Colm, how about you? 
yeah, very much. I, 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 I'm always, I'm, I'm still amazing to data, and it's great to see uh, you engaging with what I've shown because that work that that means something to me because I, I feel that I'm able to really able to explain our, our technology and see the examples. I mean, we saw the ones today, and I love the, I still love that airship data. Mm -hmm. I've been looking at it for over ten years on and off. Uh, we actually have a big plot of it, not the grand color one, but the ordinary color bar uh, blues to, to reds. We have that on display in our offices in Edinburgh, and uh, we walk in the door, and sometimes you don't get to your desk because you're spending about 10, 15 minutes just staring at yeah. this. <laughs> That's a great way to the start moment. the day. <laughs> like looking at the yeah. sunrise. <laughs> yeah, uh, or when you need a moment of inspiration, you walk over and you have a look at it, and you start seeing things differently again, and you go back to your, your data manipulation on the computer wow. the screen inside the office. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a nice data set. It really is one for inspiration. Yeah. Um, we've had it on display at different conferences over the years, and we've had some people who come right into the booth and, and just don't ask questions. They just want to look at this. <laughs> it's on the wall. Asking, do you yeah. sell this in poster form? I'm yeah. going to put it in my room or my bathroom, maybe. Yeah. It's, it's funny, actually, because the um, the main feature in that image is where I, before, you know, I pointed the dwelling diamond mine on top, and then you had that cyanide intrusive or ring dike system in the cyanide intrusive. Uh, when you look at that and you look at our company logo, let's say that's where our company logo is taken from that uh, concept whereby we have the little feature in the top. Mm -hmm. right oh, I didn't know that. And we got the arms. That's awesome. That. I didn't even, yeah. yeah. So we just kind of conjured it up. And, and, and so that's we got where we got our new logo from that, uh, in that image. Now, oh, that's also fantastic. Another, <laughs> also, if you look at that image in, in a bit more, let's say, in that TZZ image, as I was calling it, you could start looking at it in different ways and start thinking about it. And um, I when we had some character and we could have compared it to the screening burning man. The screening burning man, fantastic painting that's really on display. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's you can getting... see the rib cage and the, and the arms. And the... <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to go back to that and try to pull that image out for when we produce this. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds crazy. <laughs> that guy was ready to work. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So it's, well, it's, it's exciting. Yeah. It is. And and the presentation for me was all things I thought it would be. Uh, we are at a time as young geoscientists and this next evolution of, of, of progression as, as professionals going after natural resources and making more money than we spend is at its, it's, it's at its highest. And at the same time, I got to sit there and listen to the plane that runs it, the machines that measure it, to the processing stages that take it, to the interpreter that's trying to make sense of the geology. And from that perspective and the way you delivered that information, I, I can't say enough about your presentation skills. The way you delivered it, I just, I'm walking oh. away going, man, I, I know more today. Mm -hmm. No question about it. And I'm, I'm ready to apply it. And I want to look at that worldwide data set because we have uh, at MagmaChem Research Institute, we have Cracks of the World, which was made by BHP's worldwide GravMag data set. It was published in the Houston <laughs> Geological Society. Well, that's kind of like our poster on the wall. Like we just love that Cracks of the World. When you match up natural resources to the Cracks of the World, it gets really interesting as an economic geologist. So then you start thinking, what the heck's going on there? And now you can get this kind of resolution focused down on a geologic problem that has an incredibly economic value and figure it out yeah. from this show. You could go and do that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe too much. Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. too much. Get a degree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Colm, I'm, uh, I just thank you for your time. I thank you for your experience and, uh, and just selflessly explaining those things and teaching us today was, was the takeaway for me out of all of it. It was, I've, it, man, thank you. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here to enjoy this. Well, Colm, are you ready to, uh, to dive into the conception part of the PBE podcast? Why not? That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because of the, inspired by the show, I went into my local uh, library and pulled my gra uh, elementary gravity and magnetics for geologists and seismologists book <laughs> <laughs> by uh, Nettleton. I guess L.L. Oh, Nettleton yeah. was mm -hmm. that rings a bell, huh? It does indeed. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> ah. So how did yeah. it all get started? How did you uh, how did you fall in love with those maps behind you? It's. A long time ago, I guess. It's um, 
when I do my undergraduate degree in geology, um, I just love doing the big geological mapping and going out and into the field and tying in and correlating features of interest and making structural maps. And uh, then we, in my final year, we had a module, a couple of modules over two or three days on geophysics and then gravity and magnetics. And I like the concept, it was very, very straight to me, it made a lot of sense. And I could see the value of using that kind of technology to follow through what I like doing was mapping uh, geological structures. So I, I embarked on a PhD program and, um, and it was more the same as assembling magnetic data type and gravity and other data types to, to unravel some of the tectonic complexities in offshore Ireland. And so, yeah, I, I, that was really the start of it all. And um, I went to Canada, worked with the Geological Survey of Canada as a postdoctoral research fellow. And they had been uh, building and merging um, a magnetic anomaly compilation database for the entire North Atlantic. And uh, since extended it to include the entire Northern Hemisphere, uh, it was quite an ambitious program, but it was really, really uh, exciting to work with because they were assembling magnetic anomaly data sets of different resolution, different types of lines, spacings, scales of opportunity, and building a comprehensive product. A lot of it involved in uh, a lot of thought to get more value out of the data. So suddenly started to see there's a lot more to magnetics than just big anomalies over large scale areas that you could see very high resolution features, mini dike swarms and the like, which was pretty much unprecedented for the times that, that it was. And um, mm. I, then, you know, working then with World Geoscience Corporation in, in the UK, they were the world's leading um, airborne magnetic surveyor of the day. And they were doing things with magnetics that no one else had been doing. And they had been able to use mag to image um, magnetic result, magnetic um, responses from the gas fields offshore uh, in the Irish Sea, offshore England. And that was an unusual occurrence. And then we were producing anomaly maps of dynamic ranges of five or nine nanoteslas over mining properties in, in on shore Ireland and, and being able to uh, identify geology quite coherently, which was amazing. So that was quite revolutionary. And I guess then moving to Belgium space is the same idea is to continue the same uh, approach is to find the detail in the data that we that we record. And, uh, and we're starting to do that now, which is been, it, 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 it's in its own right with gravity gradiometry is a revolutionary technology for gravity surveying. Uh, to get such fantastic detail on a moving airborne platform, which is quite unprecedented for the times that it has been. And um, it's taken quite a while to get to where we are, but it's, it's been a success, I think. Wow. Everyone seems to like it. Yeah. So it's, that was a quick history of my career today. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty dang quick. I like the way that uh, somehow you identified that gravity and magnetics was going to have such an impact on what we do as economic geologists or what companies are doing to find natural resources. You saw this technology that you said, okay, if I ground myself in this as a professional, I'm definitely having a career and, and it's going to yes. go somewhere. And that's, that's yeah. incredible insight to have as a young professional. That's, that's really, really, yeah. The way I looked at this was that, you know, I like geology and I love the structural geology and, and seeing different geological events being tracked in, in big maps and small maps. And I felt that moving into the geophysical world that I wanted to bring the geological angle to it. Uh, what can you do with this geophysical data set to what, what information does it contain that you can use to build geological maps? And, and I've seen a lot of examples of that throughout my career, not just the work that I've been doing, but with, with uh, other workers and um, They've been fantastic. They just uh, organize the data set in a way and they sit back and approach it as a field geologist looking at uh, squiggles or looking at narrow anomalies or wide shaped anomalies of different amplitudes and consider them almost like uh, bedrock geology or, or outcrop in the field and correlating uh, linear, they, they might line up in the linear pattern or they may not and you can draw lines and polygons and then look at your drawings and convert it into a geological map mm -hmm. from there. So I really, that's my route is, is, is if you get that side of it right, then everything else just falls into place really. 
it's by the leads for people or people can follow what you're doing and take it for their own uh, work programs and integrate the results in their in their own projects. So yeah. to, to kind of run it back to when you were working with the uh, Canadian Geological Survey and your research fellow, you said the project was ambitious. Was that from the extent of the project or was it understaffed or was it just, you know, there was just so much data in general that you... It was just the extent of the project because it was the first of its kind. They had previously assembled data for all of Canada and there were lots of ground magnetic surveys, airborne magnetic surveys, and they pulled them all together in the one compilation map and it was, it was glorious. And they extended Jeez. them to reach across the North Atlantic and into Northern Europe. And um, I, as part of my PhD, I assembled all the Irish data, uh, the onshore and offshore data sets together, sitting in their offices in Nova Scotia. And um, it, it, was, it was great. It was, uh, we're using technology that's 30 years old, you know, computers and mainframe technology. From, you had code writers and you had mm -hmm. software engineers and you had... <laughs> You geophysicists and mathematicians all coming together to identify oh. how best to use this data set. And, and uh, it was remarkable for the time. Yeah. And I was going to say, for a gravity and magnetic specialist like yourself, being able to see that structure at such a high resolution and such a broad range, I mean, you can probably see things that are interconnected that no one else could have even imagined before these different shear zones or these different transform yes. boundaries offshore and and really how all of this is interconnected. It's not just, ooh, we, we need to dive into the structure of this one particular area like offshore Ireland. I'm sure when you saw all that data in the North Atlantic, you're like, hey, like I see similar trends here, 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 and here. Yes. Like this is awesome. Yeah, I think a lot of it would have been precedented in the sense that the geological side of it was well documented, the geology of Ireland, UK, and Northern Europe everyone would know that that's the same geology as there is in you know, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. New Brunswick, right down into the Appalachians. But then to see it in the geophysical context, that's exciting. Yeah. And, oh, uh, and then to be able to trace and correlate the, the, the anomaly patterns across the Atlantic, it was, it was exciting. Oh, that's uh, fine. Yeah, to see that for the first time when, we, when, when it was pulled together, yeah, it was very exciting. What's the history of uh, gravity and magnetics? When did, uh, when did was the first airborne gravity reading? Airborne gravity, it's, it's, I'd say it would have happened in the 1980s, tested. Wow. Uh, not very successful. Um, <laughs> in the 1990s, then you had a company called Carson, and they would have taken uh, conventional marine gravimeters and put them on an airplane and, and tried it. And they ended up flying high altitude and wide line space surveys to ensure, well, reason being is because you need an aircraft to be quite stable uh, to minimize impact on the instrument and um, and and they produced great maps it was 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 the first really for that for airborne gravity at that time and uh, so yeah and that continued until that continued then you had uh, sanders in canada and canadian microgravity in australia and they had developed new gravimeters that gave a much better resolution but still, it was it was a two kilometer wavelength resolution, which was fantastic because they were able to see more detail in, in smaller areas, and uh, and they quite made a quite a good go of it, and and still are operational and with their technologies, and doing very well with them, and um, yeah. But then for Airborne Mag, Airborne Mag actually, I think some of the earliest Airborne Mag surveys would have been in the 1940s, would you believe? Um, wow. Who had these? eccentric people maybe that they had a magnetometer and they put it on their airplane and up they flew and it was analog recording well no digital form and uh, <laughs> some of the records are still floating around uh, i remember being when i was with the, the geological survey in canada they got access to some of these records and they were very excited and uh, and they went to digitize the analog record of it and uh, bring it together but uh, yeah so i mean but then in the 1990s airborne mag changed it, it went from High altitude wild line space service to low altitude tight line space service and the instrumentation improved and they were getting an order of magnitude greater resolution straight away and uh, and that has continued the pace now you've got magnetic radiometers and tensor systems and the, the instrumentation is reduced in size they have them on crop dusters and they have them in small helicopters they even have them on drone technology 
and you're getting wonderful magnetic detail detail of the magnetic field uh, from those type um, platforms, which is wonderful. So the yeah, one, yeah, it's it's amazing. That's amazing history. I had no, I did yeah. no idea you were going to tell me the 1980s for gravity flying. <laughs> I thought, and that's young. That's that's yes. really young. <laughs> Well, yeah. well, the first one, it wasn't the first successful one. That right. wasn't until the 90s, yeah. right? So, Yeah. I mean, Damn. gravity as a technology has been around since the 1920s and 1930s. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Land-based instruments and then you put on boats. And, of course, during the, the Cold War years, you had it on, you had the instrumentation on submarines uh, for U.S. Navy and others to navigate their way along the seabed and the like. And uh, it was at that time then we had a revolutionary change. You had... Again, it was technology was being developed. And this is the, the Lockheed Mark instrumentation that we have is the full tensor radiometer. And um, its own history is, is, is quite um, an interesting one. Um, the original idea of gravity radiometry was first happening back in the 1870s and 1880s uh, by a man named Laurent Iopoulos in Hungary. And he built a tensor radiometer and he was measuring gravity and he determined depth to the base of a frozen lake outside his, in his establishment home base in, in Hungary. That technology made its way to the States then and, and was responsible for discovery of a, a salt feature, I think an oil, an oil discovery in Texas uh, by Amrata Hess of all people. And but it was quite a slow yeah. and cumbersome technology and then conventional gravity took over because it was faster to acquire and easier to do the maths and produce the maps mm -hmm. you're looking for those salt and anhydrite diapirs that's what you're yeah, looking for absolutely. and then you just poke right next to it and that's going to be a gravity low yeah salt would be gravity mm -hmm. low yep. and then the anhydrite will give you a localized gravity high so you can see a lot of the detail uh, from those maps all, all from way back then and it was great technology and then the lockheed martin or bell aerospace as they were previously known as they had the technology and developed it for usage on the nuclear submarine fleet um, back in you know, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and it was used to navigate and how find their way along the depths of the Atlantic Ocean and the like. And that technology then was declassified in the early 90s, and we got access to one of the instruments, and we put it on a boat, and we made usage of it for oil and gas work in the North Sea, and, well, initially in the Gulf of Mexico, and then in the North Sea and offshore Norway. Mm -hmm. So it has evolved. The, the, the technology we have hasn't changed much since its original concept. It works really, really well. Yeah. We just uh, made it sure that it was going to work, say, on an airplane with the, um, ensure that the aircraft was going to be stable. There was no other interfering instruments on on the aircraft uh, that would impact on the on the, the measurements. The processing um, got cleaner. Mm -hmm. It did. It got much cleaner and much more organized. And that has evolved <laughs> uh, over the last twenty years, as you can imagine. And we've invested a lot of time and resources to to get that noise threshold right down and to retrieve very usable, workable geological signal, so to speak. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, then we went airborne then in 2002 with our technology, and we put on a Cessna Grand Caravan, which is a small aircraft, but it's typical of the kind of aircraft that's used in airborne geophysics. And uh, we tested it in the States, so we went to Africa. We did an embarked on a considerable amount of test work programs down there in South Africa, in Botswana, and in Zambia. and uh, it was shown to work and from there we we installed and tested the technology on the zeppelin airship on a big project with the beers back in 2006 and these days we're on this basler bt67 which is an old dc3 it's so it's using old technology in the modern context mm -hmm. the instrument that we have is old the aircraft that we have is old <laughs> the aircraft is reconditioned it's new engines and modern avionics so it's like a new aircraft in an old design and um, and we got pictures of that to show later. It's a uh, cool. it, yeah, it's been very exciting. So we have all of these aircraft now, and we got four instruments, and um, and we're been quite busy over the last number of years, uh, working in. I guess a lot of work has been in oil and gas, but we've done quite a bit of uh, mineral exploration survey work as well. Wow. So it's, it's good. Technology works for oh. both sectors. I was going to say, especially nowadays, where there's this kind of push towards marine minerals and understanding them. Yeah. in a much higher degree yeah. so i'm i'm kind of i'm very interested to to dive into this this powerpoint and 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 like pull up sure. some of these pictures and really see what's going on definitely sure now the the 
what what's happening or at least what i'm hearing and 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 my understanding of kind of where we're at uh in the whole field of economic geology and finding natural resources is that the the transition and our understanding geologic concepts between the mantle where there are no fractures through the transition of the mantle to where it reaches the lower crust into the crust the resolution of those events and those cracks and that movement and the fluids coming out of that driving geology those yeah. concepts are progressing in the last five to ten years faster than they've than, than ever i would argue that our understanding of the planet and its inner workings of tectonic plates and making rocks is about as revolutionary as the idea of plate tectonics itself one yes. of the things you would agree yeah i would i think there's been a lot of work in that area and that I is mean, incredibly it, it, exciting it is because you had you to predict where earthquakes or where events are likely to occur or you, you know you're going to new territory and you want to know the, what's the controlling geology here and more of the likely deposits and of that might be of interest so it's, it's good to have that fundamental understanding and uh, fundamental understanding of the processes but also where they're likely to be yeah very much so uh leading into that there's two things i want to i want to talk about real quick certainly before we get into the presentation because we're going to be looking at these images of gravity responses and high resolution and trying to make geologic interpretations on what it's trying to tell us yeah. in modern context so yeah. the idea that i had while we were talking was how much in the past few years even has a lot of the attention from these worldwide companies that you guys have been working with and doing this work for how much of that attention has gone towards the vents that we're finding on the ocean floors it seems like there's just millions of these things on the ocean floors they're everywhere and that's kind of yeah. a new thing and and your data is finding those faster and, and more accurate than anything else we have it's yeah there has been a lot of activity in that area um you know we haven't done much work in that area itself sometimes these things are just too deep for our technology to be able to uh, resolve in any great shape in detail or form um but there is a lot of interest in them because there's a need to understand how they behave how they function what are the how does the these things manifest themselves because they are modern day analogs of what it is the, the major mining companies are looking at from the geological record and um, so they, they find a lot of these mineral content trapped in veins or pipes or intrusive structures that are preserved in the geological record which would have been smokers or, or near, near volcanic mm -hmm. vents and the like that you see in, in, the, in the ocean beds and the seabeds of the wave so they do they want to both work together to increase the understanding identify the they like the mineral resource or the content and how much and how do they behave and all the very conditions, stress and, and strain and the structures and the like. Yeah. And getting my juices going yeah. this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing I was thinking of, so when I look at gravity, the whole uh, data set that you provide and you start running time slices through the reading of an area, yeah. What are the depths? What are we talking about as far as just, I guess, kilometers or however you want to say it, it, it the resolution that we see to a certain depth that yeah. you have, you know, certainty in and then all the way to the surface? Or, I mean, what what are we looking at? There are different technologies that allow you to do different things. Um, with the gravity technique, it's uh, it's what is known as what they call as the potential field and it behaves almost the potential field mathematics. So the, the record that you get, you might get these long, broad, long wavelength or broad shaped anomaly patterns, which might have a low amplitude. That would be indicative of something very, very deep. You don't really know what depth it is, but it could be four or 5,000 meters or greater. Uh, then you look at the shorter wavelengths, the narrower anomaly patterns in the higher amplitude, and they'll be sourced by something at the near surface. And then you get a lot of it in between. The radiometry technique that we have focuses on that top two to three, one well surface down to about two to three thousand meters with fantastic detail and um, and and so you're able to delineate uh, geological patterns and, and ages and rock types uh, from looking at the record that you have 
So that's the strength of the, what the gravity brings and the gravity gradiometry in particular brings to the, to the industry. Other technologies, magnetics behaves in much the same way. Uh, the seismic technique is phenomenal. It's, um, it, it emits these sound waves very, very deep. And uh, depending on how you structure your survey design, you can get right down there to, down to the mantle, down to the moho effect, it, down to the moho itself, or you focus it to just tune and look at the top a few thousand meters and get incredible detail in, in the work program. But that comes with a cost, of course. And there are other techniques. There's electrical techniques, electromagnetic techniques. They're done on the ground, they're done in the air. And they're, they're, they all are used, they all have something to offer and contribute to the understanding. And when you bring the pieces of information from each of these types of surveys, you can then build a very comprehensive picture of the subsurface and looking at the rock properties. Uh, what's a conductor? Is it magnetic? Is it dense? That would be a very interesting target uh, to drill. Uh, is it just dense and non-magnetic? Is it just an ordinary rock type? Uh, different for different sectors, different types of minerals will have different responses. And, um, and it's, it's all about mapping the geological structure and predicting what's within the structure. And, um, and so they, they assemble all the information together and then they decide on where they need to drill over, over a period of time. And, and that's really where the budget goes then because is the drilling operation, as you mm -hmm. can imagine, it's a, they move a rig around every few weeks while they're drilling in different locations to test uh, some of the ideas that they that they formulated from all of the data that they have in their disposal. So yeah, we all fall part of, we're all in the, into the equation somewhere. <laughs> uh, sometimes. <laughs> and the technology we have is very much, uh, it's used at the start of an, in the new territory where you're wanting to get an understanding mm -hmm. of the geology in quick time frame. It's also used right up to help with the look, help to locate a well when you're drilling on a prospect to get more definition. And they always revisit the data that they acquire and they, they might do some mathematical modeling on concepts, geological concepts that they have and, and try and compare the computed model res result against the measured data to see how well it might fit in with their ideas for the geological development. So it's, it's a fairly arduous process and it can be very quick, it can be very, it can be very prolonged. I, I guess it depends on the urgency and the challenge that they're faced with. Mm -hmm. and, and budgets, of course. <laughs> right. I was going to say, for, for exploration purposes, gravity and magnetics data, and not only the mining or the economic geology space, but in the oil and gas space is just so cost effective. And it's just such yeah. a great way, like you were saying, to understand those structures, especially yeah. when you're in one of these new venture teams and you're offshore in a basin that you know no one's explored yet. Right. You don't know Absolutely. what kind of you don't know what kind of structures you're dealing with, what kind of traps you're going to be dealing with. Right. Absolutely. So and, and and having that and also being able to shoot these larger surveys. Right. And then putting in that perspective. So then we can start narrowing down and saying, OK, these are the areas that look the most perspective based on, yeah. you know, we have these we have these really cool little mag highs grav lows here right what are, <laughs> or we have we have a basement structure here right like what kind of pipe would be feeding into this system it's 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 awesome it's yeah. fascinating it is it's very much a, it's a process of elimination you want to hone in on, on the area that where you need to spend the money and if you have very little information to start then the best technology to use is an airborne geophysical technology and, and ftg gravity and magnetics are the choice mm -hmm. of many it really it helps to identify where's interesting and what's not. Sheesh. And they can use that then to help shape the, the next stage of their work program. And whether it's more more survey work or ground work or, or even go straight to drill. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's it's quite a, it's a process. So we our technology falls right in there at the start and right through, right up to the stage when they're ready to appraise mm -hmm. a, a prospect. Because they need to have the extra information to give the detail and bring it all together yeah. before they spend the money or like wow. the extra monies that they have yeah wow okay so my last question if i may uh you have worldwide data set of gravity and magnetics we do we we've done a lot of survey work in all continents apart from antarctica um uh, that's next what's the coverage and, and not yet <laughs> <laughs> if a hundred percent is the earth what's the uh, percentage no. of coverage <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Well, it's no, I, I, you know, I haven't even worked it out, but I, we wouldn't, it might not appear to be all that much, but it's still quite a proportion. There's some parts of the world where we've done more survey work than in others. Um, 
we've done a lot of work in say in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, and Indian Indonesia. Wow. Uh, and, and then we've done a lot of work in East Africa and South Africa, and but very little in Central Africa. Uh, we've done a lot of work in Brazil. We've done a lot of work mm-hmm. in Canada. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of work in Western Europe, but not in Eastern Europe. So there's different yeah. locations around the world where we've got been. holes. Yeah. 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 Wow. So you got Grab Mag over Krakatoa in Indonesia? No, I'm afraid we don't have it over there. Oh, <laughs> man. That would be freaking cool to see. What about Lucy? Do you have yeah. Grab Mag over Lucy? That uh, <laughs> mud volcano <laughs> offshore? No, we don't have that one. No. Oh, I think man. the work we've done there was onshore, actually, in, in, in Indonesia. And it, 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 there were good programs. Yeah. Wow. It was over different structures where they were targeting to an understanding of, of uh, geological question that they had on an area in terms of they couldn't see it clearly under seismic so mm-hmm. they flew the FTG to get a, a to pinpoint accurately the 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 contact edge between a in a structure that they couldn't really see in the seismic so it worked for them really really well yeah what I what I liked is when I was looking at that map of all the surveys done by Bell Geospace the amount it's, it wasn't just strictly offshore and it wasn't just mm-hmm. strictly onshore it was a pretty even split between the two, which which I thought was pretty fascinating because a lot of companies are very, very either offshore heavy or very, very onshore heavy. Mm. Right. And that that kind of goes to show that mm. this product is not only being used by, you know, one space, it's being used by all spaces as far right. as in oil yeah. and gas minerals. Mm. And yeah, right. Which yeah. we're learning. I, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And government initiatives, too. Do you guys? A lot of the national oil companies and state bodies are wanting to embark and then update their geophysical databases so that they can prepare for the next wave of activities or yeah. to encourage more companies to, to come in and invest in their countries. And, and they're engaging now with the idea of doing gravity gradiometry surveys across their, their territories. And it, it does add value. Mm-hmm. It, it helps to hone in exactly where the need, where, where, where the company might be interested in, in identifying prospects. So yeah, that's another area of application. It, it's it's quite extensive and it's it's opening up considerably. Uh, uh, usage of our technology has been is finding new avenues all of the time. I think yeah. the contribution from gravity magnetics worldwide to geosciences is leap is head above shoulders against any other data set. Like our understanding of the planet and its processes because of gravity magnetics is at a whole nother level. And because of that, it's not seismic, it's not the 3D shaking seismic, it's not geocam, it's yeah. that, that is like the ultimate integrator. And that's what you were getting at. Like yeah. we see this crazy overprint and underprint between the continents and the ocean floors. Yeah. And when you trace those things, these big features that come from offshore, onshore, and they cross each other, what do you find? Massive natural resources. You magical find magical things the, happen. You right? find magical yeah. things. <laughs> and I mean, we would have never imagined that. We would be standing on the coast of you know California, looking out at the ocean, like, man, that's cool. It's just a big bowl and and full of water. But when you look at the grab mag, it's like, whoa! Ooh. Look at those freaking transform. I mean, yeah, yeah. Geology is amazing and it totally Im- just prints right into the San Andreas fall. And I mean, you just start getting totally lost onshore and man, the resources are popping out at these crossroads. I mean, it's just fascinating. That's right. mm-hmm. Yeah, it is fascinating. Yeah, it, 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 it's great. Well, what do you think, boys? Let's go down into the drill down. Let's go into the drill down. Yeah, let's sure. dive. Let's dive into this PowerPoint. Right on. Riverside Resources is a mineral exploration company focused on making big discoveries and is advancing a strong portfolio of gold, silver, and copper properties in the Americas. Riverside owns commanding land packages near active mines and deposits where new discoveries have been efficiently developed. Riverside Resources is exploring Mexico, a country with a rich mining history and an even more promising future, boasting silver and gold production increases of 5 to 10 percent per year. Riverside is also exploring British Columbia, a stable jurisdiction with abundant mineral wealth. Riverside Resources is driven, dynamic, and with its proven approach, turns knowledge into value by leveraging its proprietary mineral databases to generate and acquire high potential projects. 
Riverside mitigates risk by advancing many of these projects through joint ventures and alliances, generating cash and share payments, partner-funded drilling, and preserving a tight share structure. And Riverside's business model increases the opportunity for its shareholders to take part in a major discovery with the advancement of multiple projects. Increasing value and opportunity for every shareholder dollar. Riverside Resources. Knowledge is golden. All right, Colm. Okay. Well, yes, uh, Bell Geospace, we're, as a company, we're founded in 1994. So we've been in business now for 26 years. And many of us have been with the company in excess 10, 15 more years. And we've enjoyed quite a, a fun time making this technology work and deploying it worldwide. We started with the instrumentation on, and as I was saying earlier, on seagoing vessels in the Gulf of Mexico and on the North Sea and offshore Norway. And then they, when Dearborn in 2002, and uh, uh, we tried and tested the, installed and tested the aircraft successfully on that Grand Caravan at that time and used them for quite a number of years. On other, tech, on other instruments, we put them on a Zeppelin airship in a big project with the beers, with the Kimberlite pipes in Botswana, and that was a great success. Nice. And then we tested the, the instrument on a, on a Basler BT-67, which is an old DC-3 aircraft, and, and that was a real great success. It was a much more durable aircraft to use, and we now own three of them. Uh, the technology is, in its own right, has come on considerably leaps and bounds in all of that time. Spent a lot of time and invested a lot of resources on ensuring that uh, uh, high quality data is produced at all stages. How uh, long does it thing, take to fly a chute? The airplane actually just running those lines for miles and miles and miles. How long does it? Yeah, it, it depends uh, where you are and where you're located. It's weather dependent in many ways. I mean, oh, you yeah. don't want to. As we're flying so low off the ground, we were impacted by heat thermals coming off the ground. So the aircraft and the instrument will shake and that will induce a, an acceleration response uh, much greater than the geology that you're trying to detect. And so you wow. stop serving for the day at that stage. But having said that, when we're doing onshore survey work, um, we can be doing upwards of seven or 800, nine kilometers a day. And in some programs are only about three or 4,000. Others are 20, 29 kilometers. Wow. And, and so you can see we got a good fast turnaround time yeah. for weeks, really. Then you can turn that around. When we're doing the offshore work, we can do a thousand kilometers and more on a daily basis because there are no thermals coming off the water. So we can just keep on flying. Uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. That is. So then, in the, as a copy in 2020, we, we are the longest uh, serving sole provider of the technology. And we've done 525 surveys in 47 countries on all the continents across this lovely world, apart from Antarctica. Uh, our onshore, or, or sorry, our production line kilometer count is at 2 million line kilometers of unsurvey productivity, which is fantastic. Uh, one of the things we're really proud of is um, an unblemished uh, safety record. Uh, our HSC is, is excellent. We're very stringent, and safety is a big priority with all of our operations as you can imagine mm -hmm. you're on an aircraft and you're flying at low altitude so we've had zero accidents uh, throughout our, our history of working in this area uh, we now own four instruments and three basler aircraft and and these are used on a near continuous basis on different parts of the world all at all times which has been fantastic for us and um, one of the big advantages of working with ourselves is that um we have a technology that's useful in all different sectors and at different times of the year we can be flying service in the frozen arctic or the hot summer sunshines that you might get in, in, in arid areas and the like so it, it's quite a durable and an exciting technology to work with and of course then in these current times that we're in and um, where everyone there's a, there's a certain amount of uncertainty with the economies of scale and the like and um, at bell we, we're a privately owned company so we're well able to go and stand our ground and, 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 and do the survey work that's needed when it's, when it's required. That's awesome. How, what's the conversion on 2 million line uh, kilometer lines? How many times around the world is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a quick test now. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Colm, I believe. <laughs> hey, well, what is the circumference of the earth? 23,000 miles. I don't know what it is in kilometers. Oh, or 25,000. Well, don't look at me. As a five. geologist, this is not a good sign for <laughs> Here me. Here goes Colm. He's calculating. About, I can see it. I am. Yeah, it's about 30,000 kilometers, I guess. And so that times 
Um, three is nearly a hundred thousand, so that times twenty <laughs> for two million. Wow! <laughs> wow! So there you go. We can do it quickly. Sixty times, maybe fifty, sixty times around the world. What Jeez. the heck? Right. You guys are like yeah. a satellite buzzing yeah. around. You got to yeah, yeah. You got to throw that in there in that slide. <laughs> so like it's equivalent to flying around the Earth sixty <laughs> times. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Whatever this is, I'm in. We're catching up with Sputnik. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. That's it. I think so. Wow. But here's a picture of our, our the Basler aircraft, and many of the people out there will recognize that as a, a DC three. And you would be right. It's an old Douglas Dakota, it's a an old Dakota aircraft. It's it's just a wonderful aircraft. Basler in Wisconsin, they, they take these old aircraft and they make them ready for modern day usage. And uh, what they do is that they put in turboprop engines, they put in oh, modern wow. avionics, and um, they, they keep the shell and the design to its original form. And it's, it's wonderful. What's really advantageous about it for, for us and for airborne geophysical survey work is that it's got a nice uh, wide, long wingspan of about 30 meters or 100 feet. And um, that, that produces great stability when you're flying at these low altitudes, which is required to get the good signal. Mm -hmm. And um, these got the twin engines means that it can have long endurance. It's a good, safe aircraft to fly. And we can do offshore work and onshore work quite, quite easily and we do the transition zones work, work as well, quite without too much difficulty. The other advantage is that the exhaust system, it's not often commented on, but these are the exhaust systems on, on either wing. Uh, it's pointing up and away. So you can imagine if you're flying at 100 meters above ground and, and your exhaust system is pointing down into the ground, there'd be a lot of noise and a lot of uh, high decibels and impact on the communities would be quite a, quite a mess. And they'd be quite this concerned about 300 that. feet off the ground, basically? Yeah. And wow. um, it's... Uh, yeah. It's a big aircraft, but it's great. So we have the FTG instruments installed in the center of the aircraft, and then we have the magnetometer out here at the back. And uh, I was bigger. wondering. And so is the uh, gravity extension. machine, sorry to interrupt, is the gravity no. machine really that long inside or? No, it, it's just that it's such a sensitive measuring instrument. It's um, the, the technology itself, it's about the size of a small washing machine, the unit. Oh, wow. And, okay. uh, and it sits in the center of the aircraft and in the box, you have three rotating discs, and in each one, you have four accelerometers. Feeling and everything. So you're measuring the rate of change of gravity in all different directions of the field, all at the same time. And it, it's super sensitive that it's sensitive to people walking along the aircraft. So that if we're on a survey line, uh, no one's allowed to walk in the aircraft because the instrument will pick up your motion and, 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 and you just will end up having to retry yeah, ruin, ruin the data. That comes yeah, ruin in. the data. So, wow. you know, when the, the pilot and the operator and the co-pilot, if they need to use the facilities while, while it's on the long ferry ride. I was going to say, <laughs> the long ferry line, can I hold it for one line. more line or do we? <laughs> yeah. They can wait for a, until we do a line turn and then they can go to a bathroom. <laughs> so so what's, yeah. I'm trying to understand and, and visualize this plane flying across, you know, this is a big scale. This thing's 300 feet in the air. You can see a lot of land or a lot of water. Yeah. It's flying through the air and it's measuring the gravity of something below it that ha it's basically what I read last night was that it's weight by like force. Yes. So yeah. that is I, an odd idea as, as force to me along like a hydrothermal plume or a vent, something with a lot of energy. Yeah. Wouldn't that yeah. have a really detailed uh, response to the force as because it's force by weight. So that thing picks it up and when it goes away from it, it stops it, because it's a temperature right. thing and an energy thing. Yeah. Boom, it mm -hmm. stops. So now you have this line exactly yeah. where that is, especially if you're doing you do. kilometer by kilometer lines. That's right. Sheesh. And you, when you, and you plan your survey and you get, line, you get a survey line sort of 100 meters apart or 1,000 meters apart or somewhere in between. Wow. And, um, and so you're able to pick up the same response along a linear structure and map it quite well and, uh, and, and see it in the data as it's coming off the aircraft. It, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it, it's exciting to see that because you're picking up on events that you wouldn't see otherwise. You know, yeah, no, that's, in, in the that's surface. really cool. I really yeah, like the yeah. way you took time to take us through the plane, the size yeah. of it, 
it's stability, it's safety. I mean, that, yeah. because you're putting out people, right? And you're flying them over the ocean and that thing's not built to land in the ocean. I mean, this is a serious thing. Yeah. We're trying to understand the planet. That's an amazing aircraft and a hell of an investment. How old did you say the plane is? Yeah, like the body of the plane? 42. 42. This, this, this particular version, yes, it was used wow. for World War II. So, yeah. Built to I mean, last. Built to last. Built to last. And, built and to last. They don't make them like that anymore. <laughs> they don't make them like they used to, Cole. <laughs> no, they don't, because it sits on its back, in its, in its back legs, so to speak. <laughs> Looking up into wow. the air as well as park, it, it certainly is an eye catcher when we are mobilization in different airports around the world. <laughs> you get a lot of uh, aviation buffs out there with their cameras. Oh, on the wow, they are. And They're blown see, away. You'll by see it. pictures of it everywhere online, you know, no matter where it is. Wow. Been wow. See, that's pictures. that's amazing. That's when you know you're doing yeah. something special. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole community like love your plane like, you're like wait a minute what about the grab bag they're like i don't even know what that means i just love your plane, no, <laughs> plane yeah and, and you know you'll be flying at a very very low altitude i would say 300 feet we were flying in um we, we fly higher over built-up areas because there'll be aviation rules that you can't fly too low over built-up areas uh -huh. but for the most part you will be quite low altitude and and you know we've had some interesting moments of working with the client and representatives of the communities to ensure that uh, everyone's aware that there's this aircraft flying at a low altitude overhead and so you have wow. to get involved community liaison and the like uh, put out advertising <clears throat> on local radio or newspapers oh my gosh that's how you communicate so, with the community wow yeah and, and it isn't always the time it's certainly in parts of europe you'd have to do that in fact we have to do this in kenya as well uh, with the local communities and the tribe, the tribal communities in different parts, they, they need to be conscious of uh, what's happening. And then um, and we just we, we require the services of a company to go ahead and do that for you. And uh, it, it's good. It's it, it's an exercise, but it's it often gets some fun stories coming back. <laughs> I bet. As you can I imagine, bet. you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, what's the height that a drone can go? Um, I, it's variable heights. Again, they're restricted too with uh, various rules. Um, but they can go lower, of course, you can, mm -hmm. than, than, than a big aircraft like this, because uh, they're smaller in, in size, and you can train, you can control the, it, its flight path and the like. I was going to um, say with the drone, that's interesting because you can program that flight path right. into the drone yeah. prior that, to it even taking and off. All it's got to so. hold is like a washing machine, right? Yeah. I, it wouldn't. I don't think it would hold the yeah. washing. I don't think it, no. it's probably <laughs> different. You get like four of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if the uh, thing's doing this the whole time because the drones are struggling, that's not going to work. Uh, no, I don't think it would be a while yet before a gravity gradiometer gets in working on a on a, on a drone, drone -like technology. <laughs> wow. The instrumentation is quite expensive to 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 build, and uh, there are not too many of them out there. So, does it improve? It a while to build. Yeah, yeah. Does it improve anything by being a hundred feet from the surface and it can just hang out with topography, or fifty feet and it's just hanging out, flying those? Yeah, does it, it increase it, anything? It, it's important that we're as low as we can in the air. Safety wise, you know, very taking safety into consideration. It's that uh, the, the closer you are to your targeted structure, the better the signal. So it, it's just the way the physics of this works is that if you're very, very far away from the source, you'll only end up with a low amplitude, longish wavelength signal, if at all. And um, so if you're targeting small scale detailed structure in the top four or five hundred meters, you need to be at a nice low altitude. In order to wow, detect and I didn't know that. that signal, yeah, it's it's one of the things about airborne geophysics. Uh, they always like to fly low altitude to get the best yeah. response. Makes sense how you altitude. said that. So back to my analogy, real quick. Sorry for another question, <laughs> but you're watching the plane fly, and you're thinking about it's going through the water, it's going through the upper mantle. Like how big of a reading is that thing taking? Um. Yeah. Well. It's variable. <laughs> it depends on what if you can have. Well, it's measured in what we call units of the office, and um, units of the office. E e e EOT is the unit of measurement to take in its name from the guy who developed tensor gradiometry a hundred plus years ago. Whoa! Uh, the Hungarian geophysicist. Yeah. Iotvos, uh, uh, as the Hungarians would pronounce it, and um, so it's a it converts to say. 0.1 milligal per unit distance is because what we're measuring is the rate of change or is the gradient of the field rather than the field itself. And um, 
So we can, you can have readings that will vary from two to three Eocras, which would be very, very small, uh, to upwards of a thousand Eocras, depending on what you're Whoa, flying over. Oh, that's a huge and, scale. Uh, yeah. It's massive. <laughs> and, um, and if it's geology giving you a thousand Eocras, you know you've got something right in <laughs> your face. <here>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting nervous about flying this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably, the, well, it's more likely to be something on the mountain that you're, you're trying to cure. Uh, but no, mostly the, the responses in the final processing can be anywhere from one to about 30 or 40 years from experience. And sometimes higher. And if it's higher, it's wonderful because then you know you're into a, you're after detecting a, a super large, dense structure in the subsurface. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's variable. But we, we, we aim to get a resolution right down um, as best, as close as we can to one year uh, It's currently at two years uh, which is good. It's 0.2 milligrams per kilometer, which is still quite a quite a good resolution. And the other side of the coin then is looking at the size of the anomaly or the size of the feature that you're able to see. So you, you get different providers of these technologies, and they always talk about the behavior of the instrument. And we like to say the instrument is the instrument; it works. Uh, but it's what's the size? What's the smallest size feature you can see in the subsurface? Right. And mm -hmm. typically, we might say it's about feet. Something might be 20 or 30 meters wide. It might be buried at 100 meters. And that might be the smallest size feature that we could see so in a very small area location. Feet. It's like a football yeah. field. Exactly. Or else then if you're looking at much larger features, you might have a series of many, you might have several, eight, several lines detecting that. And then so you have more lines detecting a feature, then your your noise threshold goes down because you're more, you're more, you're more sampling of the same feature. Wow. So you start to see smaller features or see it in more detail with a greater uh, level of accuracy. Mm. And uh, wow. there are a number of steps that you have to apply in the in processing and interpretation stage to, to get that kind of information out of it. Right, and, uh, which yeah. is really, really important to this whole presentation because you guys are doing a processing uh, manipulation in a sense to get the higher resolution stuff. And so when yeah. you talk about, well, where does that data come from and what could disrupt that data, which is disrupting our interpretation and making us potentially make a mistake. Where are the limitations of this technology? It sounds really, really good. I mean, you just explained kind of how do you set up the measurement? What are you actually measuring? And then how that's processed into some kind of visual. And that was great. It made, it made really good sense on how it actually does that. But yeah, my I question is outside of that, are there limits? Are there any other limits that hurt interpretations? Yeah, there are always limits. I mean, every geophysical technique has its limits, and, and, and gravity gradiometry and FTG in particular are no different. It comes down to the size of the feature and um, the density contrast. Is it subtle? Is it wavering? Is it, it's, it's, it's the geological source um, um, complex? Wow. Is, it, is it subtle? We're not really going to pick up on the edge of that feature. If it's, if it's vertically dipping and there's a big contrast, we will see that feature. But then again, we won't see it at a greater depth. And I think the maximum depth realistically, um, well, if it's an oil and gas target, maximum depth of true usability is probably around 3,000 meters. But in a minerals yeah. context, because they're often looking for something much smaller and much more precisely defined, mm -hmm. uh, maximum depth there would be down to around 1,000 meters, of which some mining companies are now drilling into at those, to those depths yeah. to develop um, uh, uh, operations, mines, and the like. If the, the, if the economics end, makes sense, hey, that's right. I mean, it does absolutely. And then at the other end of the scale, there might be something at fifty or sixty meters, mm -hmm. and so we might see the overall effect of a structure of interest, but we may not be able to give the precise detail because some of these geological features might only be in one part, you know, of a complex vein yeah. that type of feature. And, and I mean, you're looking for these very minute density anomalies yeah, within right. these larger bodies, yeah, right? So, right. I mean, I, that I, precision I, is key because, like, I mean, if you're looking for yeah. copper or whatever have yeah. you, right? When you're looking at that yeah. host rock <laughs> around it, you're saying, yeah. I, I, yeah. And, and the host rock, we, we've come across one there recently, and it's the structure is it, it's not a simple shape. It's a uh, parts of it is is kind of uh, fingering, little feathering sides to it. Uh, different orientations and some of these it's individual yeah. headers are very very small so we wouldn't get the precise detail to be able to map that but we'd, we'd, we'd identify the overall presence of the feature uh, and that's what's key in many ways and, and that's what we explain when we're, when we're describing how this works with wow the man I'm, I'm juiced for this presentation yeah. now yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow this is okay, really good
Good. Uh, you get to see then how, how we get through it. And I think the next <laughs> slide just takes us through the process that we embark on. And it's a very simplified overview in many ways, but it gives you an idea of how also as a company, how we approach a, a, a new interest or existing or working with clients as we have done so for all these years. And um, one of the things that we like to do, oh, I think I missed the start. That's fine. Maybe it's the next one. In this one, we'll talk about some of the quickly summary, summary of the key steps techniques that we've developed uh, over the last 20 years and we're still refining them and we're still upgrading them because it, it, it's it's a key part of our offering is to uh, always not not stand still always look to the next product and, uh, and and improving our resolution and improving our capability of Love resolving that. geology Love and, and and we have a, we have an r d team that looks at these things on a continuous basis and so we made a lot of key steps with processing and interpretation and the processing is really taking the raw information from the aircraft and converting it so that you're only looking at the signal arising from the subsurface geology, not from the aircraft motion or the train effect or, or all these other things that might impact on what it is you're trying to resolve. And the first part of that is what we call it a full tensor noise reduction. Bit of a mouthful, but really what it means is that the instrument <clears throat> is measuring the rate of change of the field in all different directions, horizontal and vertical. And each one's a unique measurement in many ways. And so what we do is that we recognize that each of them is also a measure of what we call as the gravity potential. And so when we combine them, the individual responses, we can then stack and weight them and use that to build a much more coherent, uh, minimal noise or low noise product. And um, so huh. we get a one signal bandwidth then in terms of detectability. And the, the idea here is that, um, you know, you know that sig uh, signal is coherent noise is random. So the idea is to get rid of all of that random noise from your data set and you're left with a clean looking product. Mm -hmm. uh, the other advantage is that because the aircraft or the instrument, it looks sideways as well as downwards, is that we can minimize the amount of interpolation that's required in predicting the field from one survey line to the next survey line and also beyond the edge of the survey. Uh, and so that, that adds to the heightened uh, uh, increased resolution that we're offering uh, with, with the technology itself. So it's, it's great to produce some really detailed maps of that subsurface. And we'll see examples of that in, 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 as we go through this. The other side, the big advantage of working with, <coughs> sorry, using all of the components is that we can predict a conventional gravity field. Now that might sound simple. You think, well, you know, you're measuring the rate of change of the field. It's just working it backwards to get the field itself. But it's not something that's too easily done in a computational or a mathematical sense, seemingly. Uh, but it's one of the things that we've developed that with our standard processing procedure, it's an extra product from the data and, and we get that result and it, it's it's great. And so, and its resolution is the same as that of a tensor product, which is you, are very important for some mineral explorers because they'd often go off and do ground gravity measurements. And, and here we are telling them that we can do an airborne survey and give them the same resolution. And um, we've done this in different parts of the world. There was a survey we did in Sweden in the last couple of years and they had a very good ground gravity product and we were matching it one-on-one. -on -one, uh, oh, the, the, wow. The Proof product. of concept. So, right bang, um, bang. Yeah, and it means that we can cover much larger tracts of land giving very, very good detailed gravity right. mm -hmm. because sometimes land access is difficult. There may be lakes, there may be vegetation, jungle or mountains. Yeah, or Just not being able to get, get true, have access to the land full stop. There can be a lot of marshland and bog and everything. So yeah, it's important to, to, to be able to say, yeah, you can now get good gravity from an aircraft, which is, wasn't really possible mm -hmm. in the past. You presented that really, really well, because the first one gets, a, it got me thinking about your, the limitations or the processing part of taking the direct measurement, actually just picking it up with instrument. That's like the noise reduction, really. The gravity mm -hmm. from full tensor is more about the idea, well, you have this line that you trust of data, but your other yeah. line is like hundreds of meters away. So yeah. what's going on in between this line and that line? And that's where yeah. that started talking about, you know, the ideas of that and getting that mathematically correct and, and trying to rep how it's interesting to think about how that actually responds to geology or it's, it's gotta just be responding to, uh, to, to the density. It's just chasing the numbers the, and painting yeah. a picture. That's right. It's the density of the subsurface. The, that density variation is what we're really mapping here. If you're in an area and, that you know has a shear or you know the convergent vector at the area, could you put 
an underlying manipulator to the to the way it extrapolates that it takes in consideration that it's in a sheer it's under sheer compression and that yes that's awesome you can, you can you'll get well it depends on the, the oh, honey of the yeah. <laughs> or the movement. You, you can see how the anomaly wraps itself around that feature and if it's a very sharp edge or if it's a very mm. subtle one you can get a sense of of, of dip and, and plunge on the, on the structure itself and, and, get, and get a feel for how it's uh, how it behaves in the subsurface and but yeah. you guys are you guys are at the contact liniment processing with a yeah. multi-directional steering yeah. filter what that means is that um it gets to see more it, well let's start again normally when we see gravity gradiometry um products out there in, across the industry and well, we're, we're no different at different stages is that the um the data that we acquire and you process it up there's enough there's often presented in a way that the final products have this orange peel look. There's a lot of low amplitude bumps of similar wavelength in it. And it, it's difficult, it's like it's a confused kind of record, signal record. Uh, we see that as being primarily due to near surface or surface geology that's not fully sampled because of our wider line spacing, you know, that we don't pick it all up and we don't have it worked through quite correctly. So what we've developed is this contact minimum processing stream whereby it looks at all of the measured component information and uses that to identify strike line and strike information from your data, linear trends, and you build up a database of multi-directions. And then we design a filter based on that, on those numbers to extract that information from the process data. So we end up with a much cleaner looking data set that is more representative Off of, of a... the geology that it detects rather than what we think it detects. Yeah. Wow, so it's, it's not a direct reading no it isn't really a processing stream and it's not a direct reading but right. it's a kind of a prediction yeah but it's a means of cleaning your data to to reveal more of the geology right more mm -hmm. confidently. yeah that's right so it, it's kind of a step in between processing and, and interpretation so wow. we, we use it carefully in that in that area to allow us to steer us in the direction that we need to go to retrieve that geological signal and all the elements that all the bits to, the, to make your geological map at the end yeah beautiful so then in our interpretation, then this is the exciting bit because this is it kind of comes to where I, I, I like best in many ways, because this is where you start looking for geology in your data maps. Uh, the first step that we have is is an imaging uh, procedure um, that exploits the fact that we got multi-component gravity measurements all from different directions of the field. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, it's one thing looking at individual maps, there's six or seven of them. And it's, it's difficult to try and manage six, seven maps in your headspace all at the one time. So the idea is to organize your data in a way that you can, uh, that, the, that you can work with them together. And what we do is that we take these multi components and we color blend the, the elements of the tensor. Uh, this is a technique that's been used in airborne radiometrics. It's used in seismic workflows. It exploits the fact, you know, you got white light and you can split it out into primary colors and colorize each of these components with these primary colors and blend them. And then you see, uh, you'll have a look at that later on. There's a good example of that in action. <coughs> it's an exciting development for us. Then to target and liniment maps, what I mean by invariance is that uh, what we have is a mathematical tensor. So we can rewrite that tensor as an invariant of the tensor and extract just uh, anomaly patterns directly due to targets or liniment, contact liniments, whether they're structural or stratigraphic. And, and so you can create a series of these individual maps and then combine them at the end to build them all together, build your geologic interpretation. The migration step is a new technique that we've been developing over the last few years. And we're not far off ready to roll it out as standards in our work for workflow. The idea is that you can take your final product and, and predict a 3D depth density and signal separation kind of concept, whereby we can accurately uh, predict depth from the data itself. And this is data before you put geology into it to constrain your, your interpretations. So we get a starting uh, interpretation from the data, all in a pretty quick time frame. Um, the work that you see here is often completed really fast. Processing can be done in a matter of days or weeks. And wow, interpretation, dang. three to four weeks again after that. So it, it's a pretty fast turnaround from the end of acquisition to final delivery of about so, six to seven weeks. And relative to and 3D seismic, that's, that's way fast. Oh my gosh, that's not even, 
I mean, that's like the tortoise and the hare. Like, that's what that is. I mean, in reality, right? I mean, granted, yeah. right? Seismic data, totally different processing. But sure. yeah. But at the yeah, much more but, involved. Yeah. But still, you know, having wow. a deliverable that fast because, you know, those four weeks, right? And then you're interpreting right away, opposed wow. to Absolutely. six months, seven months. Yeah. Sometimes even a year. <laughs> yeah. That, but that uh, <laughs> knock on it's wood. Challenging. <laughs> well, it, can, it can be challenging but this, yeah. this is a i mean it, it's a, it, gravity you know it, it's not a complicated concept it's no more simplicity mm -hmm. and it's just about improving the record and getting more accurate definition yeah. of that gravity record and that's what the ftg brings to the table there's a lot involved with it but we, we worked through a process now that we can get very detailed map imagery from the data which is good to coherency in a very very fast time frame Mm -hmm. so we're, we're quite excited with that. It's uh, incredible. It's incredible. And, and, and it's evolving. There's, there's more <laughs> stuff to come, I'm of sure. Of course. In the next six months to a year, knowing the team that they that we have, they're 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 they're, they're an excitable bunch when they work with this stuff. <laughs> I, I like okay. how it's the interpretation. It's you got you have that well, perfectly labeled. It's not the yeah. geology, it's Correct. an interpretation. Yeah. And that's what these three steps are focusing on to give you tools to interpret, to make a prediction. Absolutely. Make a prediction. That's Identify right. De-risk de de risk it for the investors yeah. and make the right <laughs> yeah. prediction on this data set. It's not the geology. So that no. is, that just, man, I mean, from the very second that a processing job gets shipped out and that plane starts recording, the importance Absolutely. of knowing that you know, there was a ship in the sea that just happened to cross right where he sees this anomaly that he thinks is a real thing, right? He's, but he was there for every step of the way. You're involved, you're engaged, you understand where this data is coming from, you know its limits, you know what could potentially throw it off or you try, and then at the end of the day, you're making the right decision for your investor. And that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. It. Um, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's fast, you know, I mean, it is an interpretation. I mean, what we're doing, we're reorganizing the data to look for geology in that data. And we're looking for uh, uh, patterns in the anomalies and the amplitudes and the colors and or when you see the colors and the color maps and, and, and then organize them as a series of outputs that the geologist then can engage with and, and, and build their geological interpretation from that mm -hmm. and, and bring in all their other data sets. Uh, and that, that's where key strength is in delivering that kind of output to people who work with it. At, at base level and, and, and get their hands right into it. And, and they do, and they get quite excited with it. And, and I think that excites me too when they, when they get engaged with the data. <laughs> so, yeah, and after all of this, we, we do aim for as always an increased efficiency. I mean, everyone is cost conscious and time conscious on everything these days because there's so much to work with and there's so much to do. So we said you have a prescribed workflow and a fast turnaround that offers efficiency and, and that's what we do with, with the technology. And um, yeah, this is what I was talking about earlier is that the four key pillars of what we do mm -hmm. is the, and we engage ourselves with our clients at all times, right from the start, from the initial concept to the thought of doing a survey, or they may have, they think they have a problem. And sometimes it's the, the problem that we end up solving isn't the problem that they start along with <laughs> as we as that's we discuss awesome. the issues we find other issues and then we all work with it together and that's we right. make the recommendations and, and that's that's the fun part is being is engaging with the client to help at all times and so we have them involved then with the planning of the survey and the management of the, the project itself and even when we're going through the acquisition and the quality control we're reporting to them continuously the data processing a, we do a lot, some of the processing is done whilst the aircraft is in, in survey mode. We have in, these patented the technologies, they allow us to do quick work with the data to get at the geology before we even finish acquisition. And, and, and that allows us to produce these what we call interim products. It means that a, a client can look at the data. We went by the, every third line first. So you do a full sweep from one side of the survey block to the other. And they might say, I like the signal down on the southwestern part. It's not so interesting in the northeastern part. And what we do is that when we say to them, okay, let's take away planned lines that have yet to be acquired from the northeastern part and use them to infill to get more detail on that southwestern feature. Mm, and, and, that's and awesome. We, and we, 
we change the plan overnight and the way we go the next day wow, it means yeah. that they get value for money they get off yeah. their I, I, I was gonna right. say because i mean yeah. i mean as a client right you yeah. if you shop the whole survey and then you deliver the product in full and then you're like man i wish we got more resolution for, like you said in the southeast yeah. portion of this like survey wow man, be, being able to just make that quick decision you know three weeks yeah. in before the survey's even finished is oh that's that's awesome yeah. Yeah, it's a really key advantage of what we offer. And I mean, quality these control. Products, yeah, quality. These interim, product, interim products, they're generated overnight, so they have a, a map the next day on their desktop to, to work through. And uh, and, and they, you know, they feel very much a part of the, the process. And, and you know, that's our remit, is to, to be a part of the process with them and have them engaged with it. So then by the time we get to the end of the acquisition, we can have 80% of the survey uh, with acquisition done, but the processing the, the noise reduction, the like, is just about done. And so that when we got to the final data interpretation and integration stage, we're delivering end results within weeks from the end of acquisition. So it's a real efficient uh, process from start to end. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, it never does end because there's always questions that are coming after the fact and we, we sit with them and we work with them <laughs> oh, and workshops and training workshops and how to interpret and, and get the data into their, into their uh, system. Wow, uh, it's, it's like a it's diagram yeah. of life, essentially. You get you survey <laughs> your plans moving forward. How are you going to manage this thing? You start acquiring data. It ends up being something totally different than you thought it was going to be. And at the end of it all, when you do good work, 10 more questions that need to be answered get developed and you get funded That's for true. that and you just move forward doing the good work. Yeah, and we, and we, we, we enjoy it. We get a great... We oh, do get man, a great that's so much fun. And feel very rewarded when we when when we work with them and, and at, the, at the fundamental levels and uh, awesome. we, we enjoy it. We look we look forward to it every time. It, it's really good. Part of what we do, I guess. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's awesome. Right. I think now we got some data examples coming through. Yeah. This is one with a, a quick snapshot. It was uh, something that we, we published with our client Celtic Minerals back in two thousand and seven. Um, it was a survey that was done in Newfoundland. And it was looking targeting a, a copper property system intrusive body complex. Uh, and the image on the left is the TZZ, it's a vertical gradient of the gravity field. And you get this wonderful high positive anomaly, the magenta color, quite a large, monotonous looking anomaly tapping. But knowing mm -hmm. that that's a structure of interest, and that, that is very much the target that it's we a were copper for. porphyry target. Yeah, it's just an intrusive body, it's near vertical dip, but it'd be made up of many individual intrusives. But when you look at that tire juice, that's a big feature. Where do I start and how do I get into grips to identify the detail? That's when we work with the other tensor component information and we organize it as an invariant response. And so we're able to get into the detail and identify 11 targets. What happened to the big blue feature on the, this yeah, is the north? Part, the, 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 the mathematical transformation is that um, it takes all of the measured component information. It removes the background signal and it focuses in on the detail that you mm -hmm. see. So it looks for features like this, these isolated anomalous responses and produces a map like that showing that yeah. these are the biggest responses to be looking at most. These are the key responses in your data set. So more or less you're leveraging those components yeah. that you want to see the most. That That's primarily Absolutely. what we say. We've, we yeah. found the area of interest here on the left. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. really make this pop and see, okay, is this just yes. one giant body? I doubt it. And now we have, right. like you said, 11 prospects. Yeah. And is that processing idea, is that the circle at which you went and fo did focus processing? Is that your area that the- It was actually, the survey area was over a larger block, but that was the one feature I just highlighted because we knew there were a number of these things. Well, this is the one that they would have had of interest, but we would have planned the survey to get more of the geological record to understand more about the geological setting and the structures that are guiding the emplacement of this feature. Mm -hmm. and. And that's what the client would have, would have requested because it's it's good to have this with the magnetic data and other data sets to build a more comprehensive geological oh, model man. of understanding of why it is here and not up there, for example. Or you know, there's always there's always questions. And then we get this kind of large scale anomalous effect, and that's in that particular component. And then we look at a mix of the, all of the other components. We can sieve out. I guess we're sieving the data to find the. The real targets of interest mm -hmm. ready to be followed up with with ground exploration or whether it's directly drill ready targets as they're called 
Are the really okay. dark areas on the right? Are those faults? They're the, really dark. And on the on the right hand image. Yeah, the one right on yeah. the left side of that, right there. Is that a big fault that's no, running up? It, it could be. A, yeah, I we don't. I'm not sure. I can't recall too much of the the detail on that uh, from this project, um, but it could actually very well be picking up on that. Um, it's not this particular technique that produces these maps on the right isn't designed for looking for fault features. It's more designed looking for these, these isolated anomalies or yeah. clusters of yeah. these anomalies, anomaly patterns. And I but can you see. You could almost infer that there is one because you can see it over here. Right. Somewhere. Right. And, uh, I mean, what else could yeah. do that? Yeah. It's a fault. I'm calling it a yeah. fault. What do you think, Skippo? I'm going to call it a fault. <laughs> We're calling it fault. <laughs> but I was going to, I mean, using this technique and then bringing in ground truth data. So getting boots on the ground and actually collecting samples and running those samples. Oh my gosh, man. Like when you're doing a large scale exploration play and all of a sudden now you can really start connecting those dots and you can correlate it to hard evidence. Wow. Yeah. Jeez, man. That's exactly what it's involved, yes. You, 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 you've narrowed down the possibilities of where your targets are likely to be. Mm -hmm. And then you can send out your crew to go and, go and check the record. Yeah. Dang. It's 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 uh, exploration is wonderful. It's it's great. It's just love it. Yeah, Why we do it? Exciting. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Cool. Thank so you. this was an end product in like a week's time. Yeah, it was very fast. That that, that one. Yeah, I think wow. it was it. It's, yeah, it was really really fast. That was it. Was a good focus service. Yeah, we should be cheers and some whiskey right now. Do you? <laughs> I'm up for it. If you're up for it, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> It is five o'clock somewhere. It is five o'clock by you, so it works out for us. <laughs> That's right. It does indeed. Yeah. Man, you know, they, they, say we're, they say we're drinking for breakfast, but no, no, no. It's, <laughs> yeah, we should have got a bottle of proper 12. It would have been proper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is an example from Mali in West Africa. It's the, it's a fairly, it's a very well-known region. It's a gold um, province in many, really. It's a Bremian greenstone belt. And it's, it extends Mali and Ghana and, and Cote d'Ivoire. And it, it's a very prospective region. There's a lot of high, good producing gold mines in, in the area over many years. And here in Mali is no different. The survey that I'm, that I'm showing you was, some, was actually one of the pilot test surveys that we had done back in 2003. But the data was good. And we were very excited with the results. And the client was as well. Um, what's known about geologically here is that um, the, the gold prospecting is that they've been a lot of ex explorers and a lot of gold mines have been developed along what they call this uh, this, this Senegal Mali shear zone, which is a very large and extensive uh, structure. And and off that shear zone, there are these splay faults and they're either extending in the northeast, northeast, southwest direction. Mm -hmm. But they're not northeast, the same feature across direction. the line, they're displaced. And so we know that there's the known ones are Sadiola and Yatella, and they're to the north of this the survey block. So when, when we got this data and you could see a northeast southwest trending blue anomaly and that's a shear zone. Mm -hmm. And just then when they engage this with the geology, they recognize that some of the granites, which are the locally higher density, especially where the granites are reaching the near surface, we get these localized pop-up anomalies. Mm -hmm. So that's a brilliant really intrusive. And around that they'd expect a contact aureole where you get different types of mineralization. And uh, the, the mineralogy might be more a uh, silica based or, or mica based and so i was going to say a that contact a negative anomaly yeah, yeah that contact zone where you're getting instead of that transpression you're getting that trans tension and these gold yes. veins can move through yeah. and then all of a sudden yeah. you know that's right yeah, yeah. and th you're getting those really oh man how that are the gold zone by <laughs> that contact zone this is a contact zone there that mm -hmm. was identified and this is just already metamorphosed greenstone uh belt sediments metal sediment and then these are known gold zones, which had been identified and known previously. So it's great we get to see a variable mix in the anomaly pattern coming through on them in mm -hmm. recognizing the data. So that would have given us excitement to say that, yes, the technology is working. This was back in 2003, and we're able to build a nice uh, clear study showing uh, to demonstrate that the, the FTG works. It's, it's imaging geology of interest. And, uh, and that was in 2003, so a long time ago. But it was early on in our work programs that we were testing the technology in, in an aircraft. Wow, the this geology one, then, on is a that much page. more advanced map. This is this is great. When we got to 2010, we were doing work in um, Eastern Africa, and uh, it was a minerals prospect. It was an area that's known for copper nickel exploration activity. And uh, what we see in the left is the gravity retrieved from the FTG, 
and this is the magnetic data that we also that we acquired simultaneously. Uh, when you look at this, the gravity is a very positive de high density ridge for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. You just call it a gravity ridge. It's linear, it's, it's expressive, it's detailed, it's quite focused. And then you look at the magnetics, and on the flanks of this gravity ridge, we get magnetic anomalies, linear patterns. So straight away, we're identifying a complicated structure that's creating that signature pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is dense and part of it is magnetic. It's not all magnetic or all dense. And, uh, but, and then uh, you move eastwards, you get these linear gravity highs, but they have very minimal magnetic response. Mm -hmm. So that's something, a different- A totally different event. event again. Yeah. So do, so the geologists wow. know this sort of work date to have at their disposal because they can bring in what they know uh, to, to constrain and, and, and pin down some of those anomalies and then they might see other anomalies where they don't have information and they'll be confident about interpreting them as geology from the map data that we present. So it was a great great success story this one because they would have really updated their, their geological maps to proceed with their their, their exploration activity. What's the, the lithology of the long red stringer? Um, I'm trying to remember because I, I think it's um, I, I, to be honest, I can't recall, and I won't admit what it is because I've <laughs> been picked up on this. So <laughs> it, it is ten years ago. Yeah, if I can't, I have to dig through the record on that. But it, it, it was very interesting. Um, I think it's just a, for me, looking at this sort of display is that you see a, you see coherent signature patterns, they're forming a linear trend. You see a potential for offsets, and you're seeing variable amplitude, and that's geology. It's it's uh, and the line spacing here would have been about two hundred meters. So there's a lot of there's good sampling on the record and a lot of detail in the data. And, uh, and, and incredible. It's, yeah, but even just before, you know, one of the things I learned when I was, um, oh, a long time ago, I remember sitting in the workshops and then I can learning, uh, interpreting potential field data or mag data or, or gravity is that they said, put your, leave your geology hat out the door, uh, come in with an empty mind. And start just drawing lines and, and parallel features, uh, parallel features that look alike, and linear patterns and shapes, and then yeah. you know together your drawings together at the end and look at it as a geologist, and then start to think, then start defining your geology what's the what it is. Wow! So, so yeah, trust the data. Uh, yeah, just just look at the, the colors and the patterns. Yeah. and the linear trends. So trust and, the and, patterns in those data in the data absolutely. first before you even start yeah. to use your geologic interpretation. And then once you understand yeah. all those patterns, then you can start being, oh, pick this part. Being this a geologist, then you start, to, you start to reason it out then geologically as the viability of what it might be. Yeah. And, and that might involve referring to other geologic information that you, that you have. But it, it all starts to come together quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a good, independent, neutral assessment of what you have yeah. and how to use it more, uh, most proficiently. I would have turned my hat sideways and told the instructor, I'm keeping my hat on. I'll turn it sideways. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, this is a, another old example. It's in the Zambian copper belts over the Kankola mine area. Uh, the copper in this part of the world, it's a ZX environment. It's uh, an exhalative product. This is a, there'd be copper. Exhaling. Yeah, what it is, you might have had an old ancient seabed or, or lake bed or river bed or, or, or seabed in this context. And you might have had brine solutions uh, full of minerals where there's copper or other minerals, in this case, copper. And just as you might have had changing environment and changing in climate and the like, you might have got uh, it dried up and the copper was exhaled and they formed these sedimentary deposits. And so they fill these old sedimentary layers. Uh, and, and that's what, uh, and, those, and they're quite extensive in, in, in Zambia. Uh, the map on the left is a very old geological map from the region at a, at a one to one million scale. So it looks very simplified, but it's instructive because it helps us. And uh, then the image on the right, we, we've just kept the geological contours, I guess, in black. And the color image is the gravity from the FTG. Yeah. And, and we can see patterns emerge and the black dots are known mineralization areas of known deposits in the area and that have been drilled by the workers there in previous in previous years when we started the work here and uh, what's outlined i think in brown is the Kankola mine itself uh, in the very stages of what was being mined at, at that time and it still is on being mined i believe and uh, the, the the different anomalies you see patterns and you see how they correlate well with the geology and again that's a nice simple example really of, of fpg in action for copper 
So I uh, just did. It's not been the. It's identified rather than identifying the copper. It's identifying the the host geological setting. So you you said something that kind of blew my mind for just 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 a real quick moment there. You said there was so it was this dry lake bed, or the interpretation is a dry lake bed, and you have these inner bedded uh, evaporites and copper deposits yeah. that are within the sedimentary sequence right next to this granitic body that has intruded in. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, that's the simplistic term. I, yeah. I, I, wow. You know, it, that's, it's you know, that I think realistically what might be the case here is that you said um, that perfect. You would have had erosion and you would have had folding and com complex tectonic activity, long sure. post dating the, 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 the deposition of the copper. Mm -hmm. So it's um, so there have been a lot of fundamental changes uh, to the area. But really, so what we're with the FTG is that uh, you know it's not bothered by the fact that it's a complicated geology, it just looks for these density changes, and, and that's what it's yeah, I mean, data's yeah. seeing the data. The geologist needs yeah. to see that there's potentially yeah. another geologic interpretation. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, because yeah. we've seen injectites like that where we right. have evaporites and and oh, these yeah. massive yeah. copper deposits oh. that are carried along through that hydrothermal fluid in those brines yeah. that are that yeah. are being deposited next right. to the Right, it's system. going the opposite so, way. It's yeah. coming from the intrusion out to what could be interpreted as an old lake, That's and right. they bring it yeah. back in. But this could yeah. be happening. Yeah. From yeah. you know, and it probably so it occurs both yeah. forms. One, it could be stuck in, like that is part of the intrusive and the hydrothermal vent, and you get these copper porphyry systems. Or the other where it is this is it's caught up in the brine solution, and it's just been as the as the the, lake, the old lake bed or the, mm -hmm. or the sea had dried up, you just had copper deposits forming as part of the sediment, mm -hmm. the sediment mix. So you get the sedimentary environmental sedimentary environment uh, so the actual mine deposit. is in a sedimentary rock they're mining yeah. sedimentary rocks absolutely so they, and then yeah. they extract the copper from much yeah. and that's a lot more convenient than freaking digging in a granite <laughs> drilling in a granite that's for sure <laughs> great nice okay that's pretty cool now this one is a, another old example but it's good to go through some of these because they have a lot of value uh, even in the present day context and this one was actually a uh, Quite inspirational for some of the more recent work we've been doing, which is an example I'll show you later. Uh, this is a survey we did for a company called Etruscan Diamonds in South Africa, again 2003, I think it was late 2003 this time. And they have been working, you see a picture of the terrain on the left, they've been working the, uh, this lovely fertile land, which is occasionally disturbed by these gravel runs. And these gravel runs underneath them in subsurface are telling you where the paleo channels are. And in these paleo channels, buried channels, are alluvial diamonds, which would have been eroded off from some timber-like pipe many, many distance, a long distance away. Wow. And the, these ancient rivers will carry these alluvial diamonds. And of course, they get caught and buried mm -hmm. in sandbars or ancient sandbars or, or pockets in the subsurface. Now, the other thing here is that in this area, the bedrock is karstified limestone. And so you'll get many an interesting structure or caverns or voids. Uh, and, and, and sinkholes and the like being developed. And so the Etruscan, when they were working this ground, they were done some ground geophysics and then some drilling activity and they had an interpretation that they believed in, which was this line drawing of a paleo channel system that they considered as being quite legitimate. And they had some success about that. So we decided they asked us, would we do, because access to the ground is difficult here and it's quite time consuming to do a very large scale ground gravity survey. So they, they asked about doing the airborne FTG. And so we did a small project at first, and we flew what's shown there on the map. And the red colors tells us that we are localized uh, hilltops in the subsurface, the higher in the karstified limestone and the like. And then you got the, these paleo channels or, or caverns or, or cavities within the subsurface. And we predicted that that paleo channel actually went off to the southeast. So they then they, they took the results and they went off and they drilled some of the, the, the anomaly patterns down there and they confirmed our, our map and they came back and they asked us to do a much more extensive survey, which we did. And we were able to knock more of the paleo channels for them across, that, across their That's territories. That's awesome. Area. So it, it, it's quite an exciting, so that cast by bedrock is quite key because we've done work in similar environments in, in other parts of the world and you'd have similar success that you're mapping bedrock or you're, you're trying to identify key fault structures that may extend to depth. That would host mineralization and the like. So yeah. Oh, so I, I got two kind of. One's more of a comment. One's a question. 
So in the Permian, so when we were yeah. doing the unconventional thing, one of the biggest problems, especially in the Delaware Basin, were identifying these karst features, these shallow karst features that seismic couldn't pick up on. But mm -hmm. gravity and magnetics kind of towards the end, people were saying, hey, this is a phenomenal yeah. way to avoid these different geohazards, right? We, we don't wanna yeah. lose our rig as we're drilling through because we couldn't see this a massive hole or void space within the subsurface. So first and foremost, I, I love this image because it shows how well gravity shows those karst. And then the other thing I wanted to ask, and this is more of just a curiosity question, I guess, can you differentiate between if a karst is hypogenic or epigenic? So if it was brought to the surface and then eroded out and then uh, subducted again, or if it was a hydrothermal system, is there a way? Um, to... Not not directly from looking at the data. It's not, okay. I, I, it would depend on the density of the feature. At the end of the day, what we have is a, a series of uh, anomaly patterns corresponding to the density change in the subsurface. So then we'd identify those patterns and then that's where the geologists would need to engage with their, with their ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Now the uh, this then is another type of uh, mineral mineralization environment, and this is in northern Sweden of the Karuna district, where there's a very active production of iron ore. And uh, what we have here is a IOCG. These are iron ore, copper, gold uh, type deposits, and and they're very much associated where you have major intrusive activity or mineralization along fault lines, and and this is where we have what is old greenstone basement environment. Uh, juxtaposed with volcanic rocks and, and sediments and the like. The, uh, the map that shows the geological map and those the items are colored green are known um, iron ore deposits or iron ore occurrences. Um, and sometimes they form the shape of pipes or circular shape, other times they're more lenticular in shape or, or, or linear. And, um, and so you can have the, in the form of hematite or magnetite. If it's hematite, it's going to be sensitive to gravity techniques. If it's magnetite, it's going to be sensitive to magnetic serving techniques. So there's, there's room mm. for making a good interpretation with the mm -hmm. technology. So we, we flew the survey with the Swedish Geological Survey back in 2013. So we got our data, and lo and behold, we got a number of different anomaly patterns. Um, this is our final process gravity from the FTG. We see a lot of positive anomalies, the magenta and the reds, and their their. their Quite expressive, they're either isolated or they're linear, lenticular in shape, and are quite intriguing. And we highlighted the ones that are known, uh, and we see the response clearly in the data. Mm -hmm. And then we go back to the map, and in particular, over here in the right hand side, you get this long linear um, uh, occurrence of a feature, and mm -hmm. you go back to the geological map, and it's not known in the geological map. So that's a new, probably iron oxide or iron ore deposit, mm -hmm. perhaps. So that's that's so that's the value of FTG that you can you can um, you can fly over no deposits, pick up on the signature pattern, and then look for that signature pattern elsewhere in the survey block where you don't have mm -hmm. data, uh, and and so it's good for what they call brownfield exploration as well as greenfield exploration, mm -hmm. and um, a near mine activity or far away activity, and 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 it's been used at all stages in, in the workflow like that. So it's yeah, because I was going to say that is a massive potential discovery. Yeah. I mean, oh, that, huge. yeah, if you get it age dated and you realize where the source is really coming from. Yeah, yeah I mean, you can, it uh, could the, be the, huge. Yeah, it could be huge. It's, it's, a lot of the, it's exciting. From my understanding in the mining industry, a lot of IOCG type rocks that have been targeted aren't necessarily all copper, gold uh, right. economically. So they, yeah. they get the name because it's an iron oxide and it has some copper and gold in it. It doesn't right. mean <laughs> that that rock <laughs> is a economic target, and that's right. that's Absolutely. a that's a big deal. That's a big deal. But you could do with age dates, good geology. You could figure it out. You can, yeah. There's lots of uh, things that they uh, that they would do. I mean, sometimes also you get uranium and you get other minerals associated uh, with these with these uh, mineralization systems, but they're predominantly the iron oxide, I guess, and copper gold uh, as additional. Um, products in it. It, 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 it. It's a very clear one. It's a very good one to find. Um, now, this is where we start showing you some of our newer um, oh, this is the photo. newer approaches to working with the data. Uh, this is the a, a subset from the data we acquired with the beers um, in Botswana on a Zeppelin airship. And uh, you can see a picture of the airship there wow. in the top right. 
The, it's about 80 meters long. Is the, that a real storm blue. in the background? Yes, it is. <laughs> what <laughs> the heck? So quite, we've had a few scary moments. Like oh, this. my oh. gosh. Uh, the airship, is, it's 80 meters long. Uh, and you see the cabin underneath that could sit 15 people very comfortably. Wow. And all we had on board was the pilot, co-pilot, or operator, and the instrument, and that's it. And, uh, and we were flown that at 80 meters above ground. Wow. So when you're out there in the field, then they got this masting truck that connects to the refueling uh, and the, the helium into the into the, the and it's got a rigid airframe, so it's very steady and steers a very steady course when flying along server lines. Mm -hmm. But you know, like anything, it's I mean, I mean, I steady when there isn't a massive storm <laughs> right. in the <Yeah>. distance. <laughs> Where was where's this data from? Uh, Botswana. It, it's uh, near the Zhuaneng Diamond Mine. It's the world's largest uh, producing diamond mine. And it's been in production for about 40 years. Is that a Kimberlite pipe? Kimberlite pipe. This is it here. This is the open mine itself. Oh, and this is the man. response of the, the, the various infrastructure on the ground around it. So that's the hole in the ground that they're further extracting the diamonds from and in that pipe. But it, it's the survey, the beers wanted uh, to do this survey because they were wanting to find other Kimberlite pipes mm -hmm. elsewhere. And they could do ground gravity, but it was going to take quite a lengthy period of time to have the crews out there, acquire the data, get home, process it up, and deliver maps when we could fly the Zeppelin and cover a very large tracts of land in very quick time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the image that you see there, it's for scale purposes, it's about 80 kilometers left to right, um, 50 kilometers north to south, top to bottom. So it's quite a large area. We flew that with a 200 meter line spacing. So it's quite detailed, quite focused. And um, you see lots of the responses and, and this is what we call as a vertical radius, the rate of change in the, in the vertical direction of gravity. So you really get amplified responses on, on dense, dense geology uh, and sort of warm yeah. colors or high density. And geologically, that is a cyanite intrusive complex, which is a cyanide. Of yeah, it's a ring deck system. Uh, and in fact, the world over, I think some of the, the larger gold producing part, uh, deposits, prospects around the world are associated with this kind of uh, geological environment. So uh, this is one here that's sitting in the ground, so to speak. Uh, but, but the, you know, the, the various focus would have been kimberlites and diamonds. And, this and is close not, to the surface, huh? Yeah, it would have been uh, two, two, three hundred meters below the surface. Wow. So when you look at the terrain yeah. out here, it's all sand, it's the Kalahari Desert to the southern end of it. Oh, so you don't can't see, see much mouse. geology in the surface. All you're seeing, this is, so this is a map of the bedrock and deeper geology. Um, one of the things we have here for explaining what we see in these maps is this this concept down in here. Yeah, and I should explain that because when we're measuring the rate of change of field in the different directions, we're trying to kind of visualize what that does that mean geologically. Uh, we are we do so many different measurements, but we organize them into into it. Uh, describe it mathematically as a tensor, and that itself has got three axes. It's got uh, the vertical z, and it's got changes in the east west or x x direction or the north south or y y direction and so uh, we're looking what we're looking at in our tensor information and that's a fault plot structure i put on I put the, in the tensor axis so when we look at our data we, we try and image the edges of the feature the top of the feature the rounded shape of the feature mm. uh, by looking at the, the different measurements recorded in each of these directions and the map you hear you see here is the vertical response and so it's very good picking up those, those vertical edges and the contrasts that are generated. And, and you can set, see this kind of information down here. That actually is a, is a banded iron formation, which is a fold axis. Whoa. And you see the fold cut out, and then it's been a fold cut cutting right through it. Whoa. I was going to say geology, that, that north. Geology in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that north 70 east shear that goes through that entire yeah. system seems to be driving just yeah. about all of, you know, all these intrusives yeah. that are coming in. Yeah, this thing yeah. does look like it's under shear like that. Mm -hmm. Bang, yeah. you take your yeah. convergent it's vectors and do that. You can. And it does so much information. You get these narrow little dike swarms and, and the like uh, evidence in here as well. And uh, doesn't, it, it's, 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 we acquired this in 2006 and we've kind of put it through our latest processing stream to, to get this kind of crisp uh, imagery together. Then, the next kind of uh, component map, I guess you can you can call it, is what we call the uh, oh, that's he's dead. Showing the vertical direction. The next one is the variation of the field in the horizontal direction. So it's the 
the laterally varying um, signatures patterns. And so we were looking at how the field representative of the field changes from the east, west, and north, south direction, as well as in this x, y plane. And it allows us to map the curvature of a structure. So if you're looking at a, a, an anticlinal structure or, or a fault block, or you're looking at intrusive bodies or basal settings, we can map the curvature of that wrong, the shape that might be evident on each of these. And when we get these red points to where we got the maximum curvature. So we know that this is associated with that intrusive ring dike system. And so we're getting maximum curvature on that. But we're also getting detail on the smaller scale events, which were showing localized curvature effects in the data. And then the blue anomalies tell us where there's very little curvature, there's very little structural change or structures that have been developed. And that, and that blob of massive curvature in the Northeast, that is the Kimberlite pipe De Beers that was is, mining, yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah, it just sees, because there's a hole in the ground, so it sees it as a, as a feature. And oh, so, yeah, that makes a lot yeah. more sense. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's just uh, an empty void full of air. <laughs> <laughs> so it thinks it's a big anomaly of interest, yes. <laughs> and then the last one, the other side one is the, um, this is where we look at the horizontal change or the, the, the downward influence of the changes in that horizontal uh, field. And it's what we call a total horizontal gradient. So it's looking at the edges of those curved structures and allows us to build a fault framework from that. Um, so you get a massive uh, expression of them here because there's great density change. But then you get a lot more subtle ones in here. And, and we will use this one to, uh, to Build our lineage maps that, that, that we use to directly predict where the lineage contact limits are in the data. And, and having XZ and YZ is, is fantastic in the full tensor because the full tensor system directly measures that. Whereas, uh, you know, like all of the ones, we directly measure them in the field. So we, we got raw data to, to get this high quality product from. And uh, it's an exciting uh, technique. Liniment, uh, liniment just means you have. Contact. Yeah. A what? It's just a contact. It's a geological contact. You don't really know if they're structural, like a fault, or they're stratigraphic, just like a contact, or the age of an intrusive body. Um, so the idea is that you, you build a, um, a database, a framework of all of these contacts, and then you start looking at it from a geological perspective as to what they might be. And you start poking and, out, you know, you were saying like the banded iron or a dike swarm right. or however, yeah. when, you, when you add in that hard data, you can really start you can. delineating this stuff out. And you can start categorizing the, the responses to the different geological features, and then you can make predictions what the others are like, where you don't have constraining information. So it's it's just this building it up. Crazy geological map as you go. I love and, this uh, map. I love. <laughs> I want to put this on my wall. This yeah. Is like art. Do you guys <laughs> sell this as art? <laughs> from, yeah. Or do we need to call the beers? Is that is that? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, the, the work the data is now resides with the box one and geological survey. Because um, it would have been duly handed over to them um, over after a period of time, and uh, so we actually have it on our website too. So there's a particular uh, section in our website which describes the full tensor and what you get out of it and how you work it to make pretty pictures, and and these images do appear on that, and 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 a storyline to explain how they're done. Uh, now the next image, remember at the very start I talked about we do color blending mm -hmm. of the different data sets. Uh, and I think in the next one, that's what we're going to show, whereby we take our vertical gradient, we take our curvature, and we take our horizontal gradient, and we colorize them in a single plot. So there you go. And that's what we call as a full tensor anomaly enhanced image. Uh, so you get the mix of colors. So if you, the idea with the primary colors, everything is white. You know, or, or you split white light into different primary colors of red, green, and blue. and um, here we got we, we decided to colorize Z Z or the vertical in shades of red, the horizontal curvature in shades of green, and the horizontal gradient in shades of blue. And where you got equal amounts of all three, you'll get a white response, a white colored response or yellow. And that means that you got high density and you got good curvature and it's a solid structure with a strong gradient edge of it. So they're very real intrusive high density features of interest, mm -hmm. which we which we know about. And, and wow. down in here. And then when you got something that's kind of a green or cayenne in color, it means it doesn't have a very high density comparing to what's around it, but it's showing curvature and it's showing some low gradient. So this is just fairly generic, probably uh, lower density kind of rock with your sedimentary basin if it was in a sedimentary basin environment. Mm -hmm. Or in this case, it'd just be a lower density rock it could, you know, of some kind, a uh, weakly metamorphosed sediment or something in the like. And then when you get these colors of the 
the, the red or the blues and the magenta colors, it means what you're mapping here is that you get a good strong gradient and you're getting the density change and it's picking up on the edge of a feature or there might be a series of step faults leading away from the structure. So there's a bit more complexity involved. And, uh, and so you can look at that map. Quite, you know, it, it's a unique map because we have multiple measurements of all the different components. And before you might have to work with six or seven different maps individually. Now you can see it all in one, as one image and, and start uh, drawing, into, draw, just drawing lines and, and you know, <laughs> contact information and, the, uh, and shapes. And no. not even take as a geologist, just take as yourself as back at play school and start drawing circles and all shapes. And, you know, okay. You color code it and the... <laughs> the the and, white color, and is it the green or the magenta that would be similar in value because this is a this is not just from zero to this is not a scale from is this a no. zero how it's, is this color uh, bar made it's there's no real color bar the color bar here tells you how, how the mix of colors work the magenta tells you got um, a reasonably dense structure and a, with a gradient but not much uh, curvature on it so mm -hmm. you're looking at a series of faults or step faults uh, or ages rather than the structural shape the green will tell you about the curvature and where it's mixed with the gradient, you know, there's a yeah. certain amount of curvature and gradient on that. So it's more of a rounded shaped feature, um, which is generally of lower density uh, than, the, than the rocks around it. Um, so it's kind of more qualitative interpretation rather than quantitative. So the idea is that you think of the color mixes and what do they mean? And you can look at that pyramid color bar, so to speak. To, and then start thinking about it geologically as to what that color is from. So the white color is coming from the very tip of the pyramid, yeah. the TZZ. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and the white color is actually from the central point where you have an equal mix of red, green, and blue. Oh, that's oh, the white. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So you have an equal amount of each. That's where you get the white. So it's going to be a higher density. It's going to be a higher gradient. It's going to be high curvature. So you know you got a, a very, very. God. You got a target. I was going to say those. <laughs> you got to target to get okay. excited about if you're a mineral explorer. Put it that, put it that way. Yeah. I, I, oh my gosh. Because I mean, the resolution that you're pulling out of that igneous intrusive feature, especially because I mean, we were discussing it last night as right. far as when we were kind of going over this uh, PowerPoint and how you can actually see the evolution of that shear system along with how that's that igneous body is intruding in you can see that there was definitely a primary event and then you can definitely see there was a secondary event after and that that that's ring around that the outside overprinted yeah. by the primary mm -hmm. too that's right yeah it's yeah, so it's, you shear it pop intrusion happens along tension so along this way of the shear right mm -hmm. you're going like north 70 e or no what would that be like 45 degrees east between the envelopes of the shear. Yeah. Bow. You shear it like this. You have tension right across that big feature. The crazy part I'm trying to figure out is that that big folded uh banded iron banded formation, that fold happened, I think, at the shear envelope. <laughs> so that's happening yeah, yes. along I would that. Probably, have probably well, it may have predated the, the shear. Yeah, or it even predated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then this yeah. big crack or this force comes in causing this tension and yeah. and like you said you that you do that again even yeah. using the same convergent vectors or rotating them slightly yeah. pop it again and you have a second event that's outside of the inner core of that feature yeah. and it's what, what's what's blowing wrenched. my mind is because i've looked at very little data in the southern hemisphere right most majority of my data that i've looked at is in the northern hemisphere yeah so the primary trend of those faults based on what you're seeing around the tectonic equator being like that north 70 east yep. right and then now you're on the southern hemisphere just flip See, that right oh, shit, or so north 70 west yeah, in the north northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere would be the other orientation so yeah, so I could see the banded iron formation. Oh my god, this is yeah, it's this is awesome. This is awesome. Sorry, brain's brain is thinking of a thousand yeah. different things, and probably ninety percent of them are incorrect. But it's <laughs> we, we're phone calls away yeah. from other geologists telling us exactly what's going on here. What? Uh, yeah, and, uh, and also in this one, you know, that you can think about the Kimberley because you know about the Juaneng Diamond Mine. That's a Kimberlite type, but there are other Kimberlites right across this uh, separate block. They're much smaller in size. And you don't really mm. see them in this particular display, but kimberlites are something that's sourced directly from the mantle. Right. Mm -hmm. Types that extend to that distance. 
So you've got a very old ancient cratonic rock uh, system uh, extending to depths of 40, 50 kilometers. And, and under duress and pressure, uh, these pipes- It's just they crazy to think up. about. Ugh. And and where you got intersecting structures and the like, it's ready to be exploited. Mm -hmm. So you got a pipe system in, in, in Kimberlite field just exploiting those cracks and, uh, and, wow. and setting its diamonds into the <laughs> uh, section. Amazing. No, this yeah, is amazing. It, mm -hmm. it is. It's stunning. Yeah, it, it's one of our better ones, I guess. And it, this is on the website too, man. There's a bit more explanation, I think, than, again, of how, how we explain the different colors. So then, of course, we have the tensor and all the different components, and we can now we merge them together. This is the, con the conventional gravity that you would compute from that tensor. <sighs> And just like conventional gravity, it does pick up on the longer way of like lower amplitude signature patterns. Uh, well, what happened to my what shit? That, that yeah. <laughs> Everything I was yeah. making an interpretation yeah, on another it. Like... Here's that we see the higher frequency content that you don't always get, mm -hmm. say, conventional gravity over such a, on service over such a large area. Um, it's because it would take a lot of time, but you get a lot of detail. But we would use this, and you would use the other map, and you can use it yeah. together. This will tell you something about the overall density of that structure. In uh, you, you've got to start sometimes simplistically, or you want to see a more regional overview, and then you want to see the detail, or you work the two of them together. So you got all of the different, <coughs> you got all the detail with these, but then you got the overview with the with the gravity of yeah. yeah. This would be like the the type of resolution you would get from night be not doing the intense processing, obviously. Correct. It's yes. just simple yeah. density. Our, yeah. What's and interesting? To, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Like old style, or when I say old style, conventional gravimeters and gravity, they would only have maybe one accelerometer or equivalent, you know, or a, or a spring mass system on, on, in, a, in a unit that measures gravity in the downward direction only. So it doesn't have all the other uh, accelerometers and all the wow. other uh, systems that, that monitors the change in gravity in all directions of the field. So there's a lot more information with the FTG than there would be with a conventional gravimeter. And, um, so what we have to do is still retrieve that conventional field and um, and give a lot more resolution. It still picks problem. up the big features. It still <laughs> it picks does, them up. There's a ridge. Yeah. But delineating yeah. in between those tighter features, right? Yeah. That's where, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like you said, it's like, yeah. oh, look, there's something that like, you know, the banded iron formation stuff is there. But, you know, when you dive into the that other image, it's just like, oh, well, I, there it is exactly. I don't even need to. I mean that that just bolsters I, I your that that the confidence that brings, brings that brings to your interpretation is just. You see how we go from the tensor information and all the detail and the complexity mm -hmm. and the color changes to the gravity, and so you can you can actually and I don't have it in this one. I should have actually put it in here. Was to simplify it, make the gravity semi-transparent and display it on top of the tensor map, and you can see how they all how they all work out together, mm -hmm. and um, you get the overall dense effect of a large intrusive body versus something that's not so dense and rather than just old old basement party and rock. And then you get the higher densities associated with the with the banded iron formation and other iron ore in uh, hematite occurrences and the like. So th there's a lot of information in just these these few maps. Yeah. It is and uh, it's a joy to work with it. You could spend a long time and as you can imagine, uh, just just working through it and, and getting some fantastic information. Oh yeah. This is yeah. awesome. But I can uh, look at these maps all day long. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, wall I art. More... It's geology wall art. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> Put them up in my room. <laughs> Drive my wife crazy. Now, this is the final one, and it's 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 a final image, and I referred to something like this, to something like it earlier when we talked about karstified bedrock in South Africa. Well, this is an example from the Permian Basin. It's from the uh, mm -hmm. of your kind of product. And it's from West Texas. And um, the idea here is that you're looking at bedrock again. Uh, the server is acquired with a 100 meter line spacing. And for scaling purposes, it's about 40 kilometers left to right and 30 kilometers from top to bottom. And all the color changes that you see correspond to bedrock in that subsurface. And it'll vary from a few tens of meters to maybe a thousand uh, meters. And um, the, the, the detail is phenomenal. The, the warm magenta colors are subsurface hills are and the, the cold colors are either sinkholes or voids or mm -hmm. caverns or just cavities in that karstified bedrock is this in the midland basin the delaware basin this looks like delaware, <laughs> delaware basin yeah, yeah. It's the delaware. It looks like delaware yeah. 
I mean, you uh, get all these sinkhole developments and the like, and, and there's a number of papers being generated and produced this, to, on that. We, we'll see them at the SCG and, and others again going forward from there. This looks like so, less loving, maybe. It is. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> nice, dude. How the heck did you figure that out? Hey, man, I I've looked at gravity Still mag data over the Permian yeah. for my thesis, dude. That's uh, I had to tie all that shenanigans into that my little <laughs> seismic survey, and this is where the cool stuff was because you're looking over. Yeah, I mean, I mean, an obvious. Big, are those stacked up fault features going like North Seventy right there? Bop, yeah, bop, so bop. those are coming off the Grisham. Those are those are synthetics yeah. coming off the so Grisham. Grisham's marsh. right south of yeah. us. Whoa. So you can yeah. You can see this stage has been used as a drill risk map um, uh, for starters, I guess. And the idea is that you know you want to locate your your well pad in an area where you're not going to have you know, drill into a void, right. and then you want to, so you locate it, and you can and you can, so this will help you to locate where that well pad should be, so that you can locate on top of a pink anomaly rather and than a, a blue anomaly. It's a, it's and, picking up structure too. I mean, yeah. there's there's so many it things is, about yeah. this, yeah. It's wow. quite, and then, of course, it's also been used and it's been developed or looked at by different seismic groups uh, using it to help them to build those shallow velocity models yeah. to help with the seismic processing so right. you can get an extra layer of information to get an even better seismic record uh, from, the, from, from, that, from that data type. Fantastic. So yeah, here that's, you that's, just get a density change and then you can predict the velocity from there. Right. That's, so that's lights that. out, especially for operators in the Permian now right. that are rigged yeah. down. And they have time to assess and like evaluate these different geohazards before they go back and ramp up their drilling programs again. Yep. I think this time oh, yeah. is invaluable, right? No when you're, question. if you have this gravity data, if you don't get it, yep. so you don't freaking lose another rig when you're doing these tight spacings or you're trying to, you're just poking holes as fast as you can. So that's right. De-risk it Absolutely. and then go back in and drill safely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. That's what it's about. Yeah. So yeah, so that's that. There are the examples that I have to show. And there's the, 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 the slides that I have. Man, I want to yeah. applaud. Yeah, man. I want to <laughs> applaud this. This was oh, Skipo did it. He yeah, did it. I'm doing it. it. This is it. This Come is on, it. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Cole oh, Murphy. You. That presentation was to, for me. It was I, I developed a lot in mm -hmm. my understanding of the geophysical world, and mm -hmm. then I loved also that you guys are integrating with. You would call it competition, maybe maybe internally with geophysicists, a grav mag company and a 3D seismic company. But no, you guys are showing that the integration of the two. Mm -hmm. You yes. have a you yes. have you have a like minded professional set that's yeah. doing two different things, but they get it and they and they and they're integrating. Yeah, and they're integrating, and we work well with other companies and uh, and to to get the best value from the data sets that we have in order to move new projects forward for yeah. our clients. So I speaking mean, of, uh, I was going to say, go just from, you know, that gravity magnetic on that exploration to that 3D seismic exploitation, right? Yeah. That that transition yeah. is it, as seamless as it can be is the most important thing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so we, let's begin the completion part of this show. We'll, re, we'll, we'll try to make it quick because we've uh, taken a quite a long time having some fun with you, Coleman. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for, okay. for dragging this, uh, this on. This is, it's just been fascinating. Every slide was more information and more, uh, for me, it was just more data that my mind processed into the confidence of GravMag, into how we use it, why we use it, and the future of, of GravMag with new geologic concepts. It's just, the future is so bright as a, for me personally, as geoscientists and everybody that I know that's in the geoscience community and, and economic geology as a profession, we're so excited to finally get things like this that are truly integrated. They're tested and they're proven. And now we're making new mm -hmm. predictions with new concepts in modern context. And we're making these discoveries that have to be made today across all borders. We have to get better at finding natural resources. The bottom effing line. It's frustrating to to fail. It's frustrating that you know it didn't work out for whatever reason. There is no more excuse for my generation. There is no more excuse for any generation moving forward. Mm -hmm. You should not be making mistakes. Let's let's eliminate these things. Remove the doubt. Get confident operators and service providers together and make the new discoveries. And that's what. And so for the future of Bell, of Bell Geospace, 
where is the focus? Where are you guys really driving a lot of attention? I mean, the oil crashed and, and mining is, is definitely going up, maybe even potentially a bull market. It's, it's, it's exciting and, and you guys are able to move. You're an agile company in, in regards to economic geology. So where's the focus right now for the near, near uh, future? It's, it's, it's both in many ways right now because even you know, oil and gas has been very, very good over the last 10 years. We've had fantastic surveys and fantastic results. And even, even with a low oil price environment, it still works because uh, what we have is a, it's a cost effective technology that can quickly make sense of large scale areas. We can, people can use it to reduce risk in their work programs or to help them to escape from uh, license commitments. They can provide uh, FTG and airborne geophysics to help them to quickly overview, review the geology, make sure they're not going to miss a target before they relinquish ground and the like. And then you have that, and then this is coupled with, yes, there was a resurgence now in mineral exploration. And uh, exploration for minerals has, has been through uh, pretty some dire times, really, over the last 10 or more years since that 2008 uh, currency crisis and the economic crash of the time. Uh, but it is picking up. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, in finding uh, good minerals uh, for the development of these alternative sources of energy with car batteries and lithiums and the That's cobalt right. and and then you need there's a need a real need for copper because if you're having a lot of electrification going on you're going to need a wiring so copper is ideal for oh, that wow. and, and then of course with the recent you know number of months with COVID 19 and the impact that that is having on the world economies the gold has been seen as a safe haven so people are buying heavily into gold mm -hmm. and the gold prices increases and so when that increases and the economies pick up and people want to get back to work Sure. People want to rebuild their economies and they mm -hmm. want to modernize their infrastructure and, and start building new roads or buildings or wow. uh, going forward, which, which you know, even with they go the last 10 years, there's been not a lot of road building going on worldwide or a lot of activity in that area. Yeah. But it's starting to see a renewed activity and it all requires metals and mm -hmm. the base metals and all the good stuff. Uh, and so I you see mineral expression picking up over the next while and, uh, and it's getting quite busy as people want to restock their, their, their metal base and, uh, and, and move forward. Uh, there's countries and governments want to move forward with both programs and the like. So it, it's it, exciting. Yeah, it, it is an exciting time. There's quite a diversity and, and FTG is the technology that works for oil and gas and for minerals. And we've been through different spells, I guess. Um, there was an oil crash at the end of 99 around that time and that was pretty dire for everyone i guess and we, we came through that and then we, we joined the, the surge in the mineral exploration activity in, in the early mid 2000s and also at the same time there was an increase in oil and gas activity so we were quite busy and even with the mineral with the commodity price crash oil and gas took off and we were, we were so versatile to go in that direction and have our data being used to find new interesting targets in East Africa and the like. And here we are now with the minerals um, environment. And, and again, technology, uh, we have a far greater understanding and it's working. We can see far more usage of it. Right. There's far more instruments out there and far more aircraft to carry those instruments and a lot more expertise. And so the skill sets are there and we, we, can, we can make good, uh, rapid, efficient workflows and, and help with the, the, the exploration activity uh, for all of these wonderful commodities. Yeah. Right. So we see it's a good future ahead. Yeah. No, no question about it. You saw it when you first got in the industry. You locked on to a technology that you saw to bring value extreme across the, the globe. And now you're yeah. seeing it again. Something crashes, moves, and your company's able to be agile at times like this because of the value it brings to the whole Absolutely. idea of geology. So, man, the future is bright. That's exciting. And, and the route, the route is good data to map geology. So if you don't have, you can't see the geology in the data, you're not going to do well. Mm -hmm. So in, in, you know, and, and the idea then is to get the right kind of data to spend time and making sure your instruments are working right and that you got the right software developed, the right codes, the right algorithms developed to get that signature pattern, yeah. and then present the geology from the data. So that's key, and that's the driver for an awful lot of work programs, both oil and gas and minerals, and, and and that's where we see our work programs going forward. You know? Man, I think I mean, cool. unless you guys got anything else to add to the completion of this show is pretty quick, but very direct. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Enjoyed it. Awesome. OK, thank well, you for your time. It's great. Yeah, it was. Yeah.
Well, we don't want to keep you up too late. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> get some scotch. Uh, yeah, get some scotch, get some dinner. <laughs> oh, yeah. Couldn't talk to the table when I said. Yeah. Right. Right on, Colm. Well, thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Riverside Resources is a mineral exploration company focused on making big discoveries and is advancing a strong portfolio of gold, silver, and copper properties in the Americas. Riverside owns commanding land packages near active mines and deposits where new discoveries have been efficiently developed. Riverside Resources is exploring Mexico, a country with a rich mining history and an even more promising future, boasting silver and gold production increases of 5 to 10 percent per year. Riverside is also exploring British Columbia, a stable jurisdiction with abundant mineral wealth. Riverside Resources is driven, dynamic, and with its proven approach, turns knowledge into value by leveraging its proprietary mineral databases to generate and acquire high potential projects. Riverside mitigates risk by advancing many of these projects through joint ventures and alliances, generating cash and share payments, partner-funded drilling, and preserving a tight share structure. And Riverside's business model increases the opportunity for its shareholders to take part in a major discovery with the advancement of multiple projects. Increasing value and opportunity for every shareholder dollar. Riverside Resources. Knowledge is golden.